Before we begin, just can I remind members and witness to make sure their mobile phones are completely turned off, please. Uh, today we're dealing with, uh, sorry, today we're dealing with um, the engagement with uh, the new chairperson designate of Tigers, Mr. Liam Herity. Uh, and we want to, the purpose of the meeting today is to hear from Mr. Herity on his approach and undertaking role as chairperson and his vision for Tigers over the next number of years. Before we begin, I want to bring to your attention witnesses are protected by absolute privilege and respect of the evidence to give to the committee. However, if you are directed by the committee to cease giving evidence in relation to a particular matter and you continue to do so, you are entitled thereafter only to qualify privilege in respect of your evidence. You are directed that only evidence connected with the subject matter of these proceedings to be given, and you are asked to respect upon any practice to the effect that where possible you should not criticise any charge against the person or entity by name in such ways to make him or her identifiable. Members are reminded of long standing parliamentary practice to the effect that members should not comment on or criticise any charge against either a person outside the House or an official by name or in such ways to make him or her identifiable. Mr. Hurry, I now ask you to make your opening statement, please. Good afternoon, uh, Chairman, Secretariat, and electoral representatives. I welcome the opportunity to pre present uh, this opening statement to the committee. Uh, and first of all, in the, particularly in the fact that I've been newly uh, elected chairman of the authority, uh, I welcome the opportunity to meet with you on a personal basis, even though I've met many of you uh, on a personal basis in the past. I think it would be fair to say that over the last 12 months, uh, from a farming point of view and indeed the industry, that we have witnessed some of the most uh, severe weather events in living memory. But what is important to state is that TAGUSC has been centrally involved in supporting farmers through its lead role in the, in, through the interagency fodder group that was established by Minister Creed. There is a possibility, even though we may hate to admit it, that weather events like this will occur in the future. And Tagus, of course, is very conscious of the need to support the sector in the mitigation of greenhouse gases and its adaptation of climate change. The focus will be a key priority for the organisation in the future to ensure its sustainability. Uh, I think it is important to state that Tagus has been in existence now with uh, 30 years under its present name, and the whole remit is to conduct research in the area of agricultural production from a food processing perspective, but also to provide and deliver advisory and education for its farmers. Uh, our mission sta statement, of course, is very clear to provide and to be an independent provider of science-based innovation in the agri-food sector and indeed the wider bioeconomic area to underpin profitability, competitive competitiveness and sustainability. What is important to state from a TAGDISC, uh, you know, a budget perspective, and my, my own children say, say to me so often, Dad, you're always talking about money, so excuse me for embarking on that area again. In relation to TAGDISC budget, its current budget is 187 million, which is unique as a non-commercial body in having a relatively large proportion of what we regard as grant in aid income, which last year amounted to 56 million euros. <coughs> this non-grant in aid income comprises of uh, where TAGISC is successful in competing for quite a number of contracts in relation to the area of research and advisory funds, both at national and EU level. That 56 million is also made up of advisory and educational fees also from the income in relation to its farm profits, industry levies, and all other professional levies. So, in short, TAGUS receives a further 125 million of subvention from the Department of Agriculture and Food, of which 43 million effectively is a pension fund that is allocated. So, in short, that 43 million is effectively money in, money out. So, in short, I would say that our income is made up of north of 80 million directly direct subvention from the Department of Agriculture and Food, and a further 56 million last year, which would have been fee earned income, and that is there to fund our capital expenditure, pro expenditure program. TAGISC has a staff of somewhere in the region of 1,200 full-time staff, which includes contract people, and in addition to that, TAGISC has about 280. Walsh Fellows, comprised of 260 people who are studying at PhD level and a further 20 uh, doing a master's programme. 
And those people are hugely important from the point of view of fueling the whole research and advisory field for the future. On the ground, which Tagdesk is probably best known for, would be its advisory offices. It has 51 advisory offices, and that number of offices would have been significantly higher. I think they would have been somewhere in the high 80s prior to my uh, in a number of years back. In addition to that, we have seven agricultural colleges, four of which are owned by Tagusk, plus a further three which are privately owned colleges but that are subvented by Tagusk. And in addition to that, we have seven research centres uh, covering a diversity of agri and food related issues. It would have six operational programmes that are hugely important from both from a research, uh, advisory and training perspective. And in short, one, number one would be animal grassland and research and innovation. Then we have food research. Three, one which would be quite smaller would be crops, environment and land use, rural economy and development. And on the ground, we have uh, advisory and the associated work that is associated with that. And one thing that is hugely important for our young farmers would be the whole area of education and training. Just to briefly deal with all of those, Tagdesk's aim, of course, is to drive productivity in the area of dairy, beef, sheep and pig sector without compromising sustainability. And that is something that I would like to underline and underpin. Despite the very difficult year we've had, you know, 2018, uh, you know, the food harvest target to increase milk production by 50% up to in the year 2020, that is likely to be met this year. And I think that is something that would have to be seen as being very positive. There are two central pillars to tag this ruminant livestock area, uh, and that is the whole area of genetics and grassland improvement. And only within the last two weeks, Tagus recently embraced the potential of digital technologies to transform pasture-based agriculture through the recent launch of a 40 million investment program called Vista Milk. But I think what is hugely important in that was that it is something that is co-funded by the Department of Agriculture, Science Foundation Ireland, and indeed the industry participants in the area of, of agriculture. And that uh, cohesive uh, tripartite involvement is something that is hugely important as I see it. In relation to food, food is obviously at the hub of what we do, because there is little point in producing food. We need to process it, but what is hugely important is to add value. And in that area, as I see what is hugely important is tag us through its Moorpark uh, technologies and innovation, which is where tag us is 51% stakeholder. Invested uh, in the very recent past, or are investing right now, 10 million in Moorpark Technology Limited, and we've also further 10 million earmarked in the whole area of Food Technology Hub, which will be based at Moorpark in Fermoy as well. Only within the last week, the Minister opened a prepared consumer food centre at Ashtown, and that is something that is there very much to get the industry up and running in the event of a Brexit issue. But it is something that we should be doing anyway, Brexit or no Brexit, because it is all about adding, adding value to the food chain. Uh, in, in addition to that, we have received nearly three million from Enterprise Ireland to establish a BIA innovation facility at the Atenray campus. And this facility is there to support you know, small and artisan food, pro food producers in that area. Another area of activity would be the whole area of crop, environment and land use. And you are all well aware of the much publicised document, the ambition for food, food wise agriculture 2025, to ensure that that delivery uh, can be achieved both in terms of sustainability, in both economic and environmental terms. Key to achieving these objectives will be the redoubling of our efforts. In the, in the development of better varieties in the whole crop area, and indeed crops that are resistant in the whole area of pesticides in, as various uh, agro agrochemicals will be withdrawn. 
the promotion in collaboration with the Department of Sustainable Forestry Expansion, I believe is something that is hugely important uh, for the future as we deal with the whole area of climate change. It is something that is particularly important where we include native woodlands on dairy farms in particular as we deal with the growth of dairy farms within the context of the whole climate change environment. Rural economy is an important area to ensure the rural economy programme, which is focused, to make sure that we have uh, a sustainable agriculture in the broader sense, but also quantifying the costs of climate change mitigation, and also the modelling of the economic impact on Brexit scenarios, and taking into account the viability of small farms and devising and tracking indicators of sustainability. And one thing I would be very conscious of is that, you know, agriculture and farms is very much a broad church. We need to, if you excuse the term, we need to be very conscious of our small farms as well from the point of view of the sustainability of rural Ireland. In relation to the advisory area, TAGLIS provides an advisory service to its 44,000 uh, paying clients, but information to our 130,000 farmers that we live through the length and breadth of Ireland. In relation to our staff that's interlinking with those on a daily or weekly basis as is required, we have 240 advisory personnel. 87 are allocated to our 18,000 dairy farmers. 131 are allocated to dry stock and the environment, but they are primarily uh, beef farmers and 11 to tillage, obviously primarily in the tillage growing area. Tagusk has and must work very closely with Borbia in implementing its origin green at farm level through its unique carbon navigator program. And one thing that is important to point out to you that Tagusk has recently begun collaboration with local authorities and the cooperatives, primarily with the dairy processors on a major programme to provide free water, quality and program, uh, free water quality improvement advisory service for farmers. And maybe the name is a bit of a tongue twister, it is called Agricultural Sustainability Support and Advisory Programme, or in short, ASSAP. But I think what is important there is that it is a free uh, educational programme that is there working in collaboration with our local authorities our primarily our dairy processors to ensure that water, water quality is as it should and ought to be. In relation to education, which is something that is hugely important because farming without attracting younger, young, highly qualified people is going nowhere. And I think that education programme is at the hub of what Tagus is and is at the hub of the future of agriculture. In 2017, more than 7,000 Learners participated in TAGUS school leaver programmes, whether it be through adult education or TAGUS linked higher educational uh, courses. We are now implementing three major in initiatives stemming from the recent review of the programme, which is called Extension of Education Pathway. And that includes uh, par uh, apprenticeships, promotion of teaching and learning practices and the development of a continuous professional development courses aimed primarily at, farm, at farmers. Excuse me, Chairman and uh, de Deputies and Senators, for I'm Chairman only a wet week, so to speak, but nevertheless there are areas of concern that I am concerned about from a TAGUS point of view. And again, excuse me for talking about money we say for a start, but one thing I certainly would like to flag, I think there are three areas that I would like to bring to you this afternoon. First of all, in relation to capital requirements, in the absence of access to borrowing facilities, TAGUSC faces significant challenges in funding its working capital requirements. I certainly don't want to sound that TAGUSC should be given a checkbook, you know, and right away willy-nilly. Uh, but I am conscious of the fact that it doesn't have access, we say, to overdraft facilities or indeed any borrowing facility at all to fund 
its, uh, its research and educational uh, infrastructure. And I think in the past it would be fair to say that a lot of the capital expenditure was funded either through the sale of assets, and you know we cannot keep selling fields forever, or through uh, once-off special capital grants from government. And I believe neither of those are you know, satisfactory from the point of view of the delivery of our objectives in the longer term. I am conscious of the fact, and I want to make it very clear, that TAGUSC should live within strict fiscal policies, but not having the capacity we say, to borrow money for even short-term purposes is an impediment uh, for the development uh, of agriculture and to, for the delivery of our objectives. In relation to recruitment, which is another hobby horse of mine, I believe that TAGUSC is an outstanding, I believe, and I believe that you share that with me, TAGUSC is an outstanding organisation. It is a brand, but a brand is only as good as the people that are there to lead it. And I believe we are recognised globally as being an outstanding, uh, independent and recognised agricultural research entity which delivers uh, research for indeed we say uh, our farmers, our food researchers, our food pre uh, processors and indeed to the government ag agencies as well. But what is an issue for us is that we are facing severe challenges in recruiting and retaining high calibre staff. And we don't want again an open checkbook to recruit anybody uh, at any figure, but I think the issue there we have is particularly in the area of the very, the very low starting salaries which we are obliged to offer young, highly qualified researchers in particular. And I believe a slight tweaking of that entry level through various recognition of the qualifications and the work experience they have, I believe would be of enormous we'll say, advantage to us there. Another area, and I touched on it earlier on, would be our whole educational programme. We have, at the present time, a waiting list, and we have a difficulty in facilitating the large number of students that are on a waiting list for both part-time and distance learning courses, unless we are enabled to continue to recruit contract teaching staff. I do appreciate that we have had that facility in the past, and we certainly would welcome that that facility would be afforded to us in the future as well. But very clearly, education is something that is hugely important to us from a TAGUS point of view, but we need the appropriate funding to do it. And the reason I'm saying that is twofold. Successive governments have been hugely supportive to agriculture from the point of view of uh, the transfer of farmers from a farm from one generation to the next, A, from the point of view of stamp duty, and secondly, from the point of view of the very generous capital tax allowances that are available. In addition to that, we have a grant programme that's available at the moment, which offers uh, a significant extra grant allocation to young qualified farmers, where they make investment on their farm, whether it be building a new milking parlour or making their farms more sustainable. But we need farmers, which is only right and proper, that have the appropriate young farmers, that have the appropriate level of, edu of agricultural education to facilitate that. And it is in that context that I think it is so important that we accelerate our educational programme for our young farmers to avail of the important uh, facilities and schemes that you have put in place for them. So with that, thank you, Chairman. Thank you very much, Mr Herr. You know, last members, um, Deputy Penner was first in the care and Senator Lombard. Yeah, th Deputy thanks Khan. very much, uh, Mr Hurley and Professor Boyle, for coming here today. Uh, I wish you very well in your role as chairperson, incoming chairperson. It's an exciting time and yet a challenging time to be uh, coming into the role and in terms of Chagas. And I know you've outlined the various programmes and things like that. Um, in, in terms of the 56 million that's non granted in aid um, income, uh, where does that mostly derive from? Uh, what what organisations? Is it from uh, uh, research projects that are undertaken by Chagas or is it in, in, co in collaboration with the the dairy cooperatives, or where is it? Um, I, I think you're also involved in the, that, that agricultural farm down there. I raised a couple of issues about it in the winter, the new winter system down in down in uh, Kenny. 
there which were during the last winter where it was out out well, further out wintering enough of uh, dairy cattle, dairy cows. Now I'm, I'm I have a concern about that, and I might as well be straight and honest. And indeed, in recent weeks, I've been contacted again by people who have concerns about it, and uh, particularly in the context of what you very rightly and acutely identified as climate change issues. And was the, the, the objective, and obviously it's part of research in that I think it's a collaboration with the with the, the co-ops and, and that and. Uh, it's, 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 it's might be meritorious at the beginning, but because of changes in, in, in climate and that, and because we're somewhat different in New Zealand and other places where this has been adopted, uh, you know, I was to call about the number of cattle lost. I'd like to see the numbers that were actually lost. I'd like to see the tags of all those animals being available uh, in terms of losses, uh, because uh, some of the information I got that, that was, was worrying. Uh, and uh, so I, I would, uh, I mean, you're, you're, you're the research body. Uh, you know, part, part of the arm of the state, and making sure that all is done that can be done in this context. So I would ho hope that for reassurance in that regard, that what, that what occurred last February, March, during that particular uh, unusual spell, I have to admit, and, but nevertheless, now that we're aware of it, we must be in an anticipatory mode and precautionary mode, so as to ensure that that's not doesn't happen again, and that animals will not be left in that, that position. Uh, and that won't come new to Professor Boyle or anybody else. I raised this in this, in this committee, uh, and it's just, it's just ensuring that we do everything we can. I'm not saying that anybody does anything deliberate or anything. It's just the, 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 the situation that arose. Um, I want to compliment. I mean, I'm, I'm, I come from this end of the spectrum, and indeed, some of my colleagues in Chagas are now coming to the end of the road, <laughs> and they're going to be part of the 43 million. <laughs> rather than part of the you in at the other end where you want where you are now focusing upon and rightly so. Um, the Vista milk program is an excellent program and I think um, I think we'll see benefits from that uh, about how to gain from our, our pasture based um, agriculture and grassland based agriculture and the potential there and the selling point is it and I think that would be good even in terms of the um, developments in terms of the infant formula market, which we have a significant, a, a disproportionate positive share of, and, and well done to everybody involved in that, including yourselves. Um, and Moor Park is obviously still to the vanguard of, 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 of significant technological developments, and made that go. And of course, Grange, I can't but not acknowledge Grange and the work, I suppose it's nearer to us by Senator Daly, the work in the, in the, in the beef and the sector and, and the, the dry stock sector. I'm very glad to see one of our premier, one of the finest footballers, probably one of the top ten in the country, is now there doing, doing his research and doctors. Um, John Heslin is one, one of your people, so an excellent person. So I'm looking forward to his output in due course and reading it. Um, in this regard, 2025. To, uh, this might be a question, even not for you, but might be for Professor Boyle. Uh, are we, you know, in the context of Brexit and everything else, could you give me a broad outline? And I know it's not fair because no one knows, I suppose, insofar as your expertise in this area, how do you see us fitting in? As, uh, assuming, probably, we have to assume the best case scenario, but prepare for the worst case scenario. So, in a worst case scenario, how would that hit the targets that are outlined, the very ambitious targets are outlined in, in Foodwise 2025 in that regard? Um, I know that, that, that I'm delighted to see LIAs, and it's a great to see LIAs with the local authorities. There was always a close relationship, even at local level. I know in Westmead and in any event, I was always there. But now you have kind of a formalised programme in terms of improving our water quality and, all, and everything. Now I'm working together in a collaborative and a cooperative way with, with, with the, the local authority and the farm organisations and indeed yourselves. I think we can make a significant dent in relation to that because. I have to come to the education because this is this is where it's at. You know, how many of those seven thousand learners are people who actually are going back to the home farms? You know, because I mean a lot of people, you know, I mean some people do it and thankfully they do it because they'll be employed by Kerry Foods and employed by we need them all there to be available. But, um, in, in, in this regard it's it's important that they're available for that that as well. But many are going back and I know has uh, I'm delighted to see one, the CPD for farmers. It'll be interesting to see that. That's a novel concept, 
but it is important because it's important that farmers who are middle aged and advancing get an opportunity to participate in, in, in ongoing professional development in that, re in that regard. So I'm, I'm, I'm pleased about that. The capital requirements, um, I mean, how much land have you, have you, you, can you dispose of without impacting upon your core key objectives in terms of research? and development and advisory services, which are key to you, how much more land is available for that. Because in the absence of the sale of capital assets such as land, or direct capital subvention from by the way of direct vote from the government, the department's budget from the government, how else are you going to raise money? That is, I think that's the key question. Uh, you know, I mean, you have a lot of objectives laid out, and there seems to be a lot of new innovations there by yourselves. The waiting lists for young people is a cause of concern. I think it's, it, it's, it's better now than it was, but yet, I mean, you have done your best. But I see you have identified the reasons for it. So I suppose that's a good start. Normally we'd be uh, querying you as to the reasons, but I mean, you're, you're saying that you don't have enough people. You're saying that the, uh, the salary and offer to young qualified researchers in particular is inadequate. And I'd probably broadly agree with that. Uh, because I know of young people who can make <laughs> better income on, on a different day. But uh, surely, have you brought this to the attention of government? Because, you see, what's happening now is there's an incongruence between government policy, which is to accelerate intergenerational transfers, and where we have less than 1% of agricultural land becoming available in the market every year per annum for, for somebody, to, somebody new to enter. It's very difficult to enter. That's the problem. It's very difficult to enter. I have a young person rang me this morning on the way up, ready to take on 150 acres. I want to see what I query to speak to the person who may have a possibility of leasing that. So there, there are young people out there. Uh, and, uh, but the problem is we are actually here advocating as a committee, and we did this, the stamp duty and the capital acquisition to inheritance taxes and all like that, absolutely tremendous, great policies. But if they if, if, if can't function because you have the 30 of the age limits and everything else, and if you can't get the young people through, if it, there's, there's a log jam at your end and uh, an inability to facilitate them. And what you're saying is we need additional resources to ensure that those online and distant education courses, and indeed direct courses, let them be in wherever they are, Mullingar, or Paddy Hayes, or mm -hmm. McCarthy, or wherever it is, that they'll be made available at Murray or whatever. That they be made courtine, that they all be made available because that, 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 that's absolutely critical. So I, I support your efforts in that regard. I think we will have to tackle this head on, uh, probably with the Minister on your behalf, to ensure that um, additional resources are made available to it. And I see notice that you're, um, you, you'll need full time people in those roles. You can't have part time, will only be uh, uh, stick and plaster solution. You need full time people. Because otherwise, you'll, you'll, you'll cure the problem now, and then it'll, it'll accumulate again. So I, I, I support you. Wish you well in your role as chairperson with Professor Boyle, who was a long time there. And um, I, I, know, I know that you'll do a good job, uh, and your role is actually pivotal to ensuring that agriculture is in a position to meet the challenges and, and opportunities at the lay ahead. Thanks, Deputy. Uh, Senator Lombard, next, please. Thank you, Chair. Um, first of all, I'd, of course, welcome the new Chair and, of course, to the Director of Taggart Till's meeting. Um, I think it's very, very important that we, as a committee, can discuss with you, I suppose, from the leading organisations, the agricultural community, your vision for the agricultural community in a very, very challenging time, whether it's weather issues or whether it's the actual age profile of the farming community, which is probably a bigger issue for us. I think they're issues that we really need to discuss. And if I could just ask about the age profile of the actual organisation itself, Tagisht, and how do you feel that actual age profile is going to go forward in the next coming years? You stated in your address that there was an issue with funding, bringing in graduates, bringing in people at, a, at the level itself. My understanding of the organisation, from my point of view, is that you have a very, very good, very solid um, core of advisors, but they are of a certain demographic and they are of a certain age. Do you have a fear that that issue is going to play out, a bit like the farming issue itself, that you will have a situation in five, ten years' time that you'll have an age profile 
of retirements and your lack of bringing people into the other side could be an issue for you going forward. So maybe you might explain to us the actual age profile of the organisation and how do you see your actual plans going forward regarding the organisation of Tagisht. And I suppose age profile of farming is probably the biggest issue in so many ways. I think there was a study produced a few years ago that said there was more farmers over 80 than under 35. And how we deal with that will be through education. And maybe you might expand on what are your long-term plans to actually improve the edges education offering that is available for the actual agricultural community of whatever age or whatever gender itself. Um, you might elaborate, if you could, on the success or some people might say the failed success of things like uh, discussion groups. Um, I remember one myself, very, very successful, but some would claim that the new regime discussion groups haven't quite taken off that um, in many ways we're having discussion groups outside of the department-led scheme and it's been run by Tiger still, but in a kind of ad hoc way. Because if you look at training of farmers and training of the knowledge transfer, discussion groups is probably the key tool that will be used going forward. And also, you know, I might ask you to elaborate on the apprenticeships and the training in, in you know, section fives or um, fives and sixes. Um, an issue that has materialised in my part of the world, and I suppose it could be any part of the world, is how trained are the host farmers? What is the audit system that we are providing for these host farmers? Do we have legacy host farmers that have been there for generations and have they moved with the systems? And have you reviewed that? In other words, like the host farmers going forward, will they all have to measure grass? Will they all have to have the ability to measure grass? Because if you don't have that or other technologies, how then can you be the minter that is required for these actual young recruits that are going to be a major part of our culture industry? So in particular, you might elaborate on the final issue of in how we're going to ensure that the host farmers have the ability to minter their actual trainees that are coming on board so the entire agricultural community can gain from it. Thank you, Jennifer. Deputy Cal. Uh, thank you, Chairman. I'd just like to welcome the new chairman of Tagus and, of course, the his, his chief executive, Jerry Boyle. I suppose, probably, in my view, the, the greatest challenge faces at the moment is, is, is climate change and the targets and the, the restrictions that climate change will, will pose on us and how, you know, as an industry, that we're going to aim to be able to adapt to those. And I'd just like to, you know, the chairman to, you know, to give an outline of what Tagus plans are. But the sustainability of food production, I think, is is, is going to be the byword for the next in the, in the next for the next decade. And we are see we see already in some of our continental colleagues having um, quota restrictions put on them as regards um, production of phosphorus. And um, you know if. It, that's, it's, it's definitely a new quota, a new quota being placed on them, and, and has implications for, but on the, you know, on the, on the pig industry side, and on, uh, particularly on the, on the dairy side. Um, just on the staff side of things, is there a recruitment embargo in place in the moment, and is it, you know, is that still in place with, with Tagus? And could you expand on that, uh, on, on that, please, Chairman? And I suppose, you know, we're three to four years after the abolition of quotas, and, you know, as been fair to Liam referred to, and he said that, you know, production has expanded rapidly. And um, expo expansion, has, expansion, I suppose, has been very rapid. Unfortunately, I don't think the profit has, has marched with it. But, um, you know, that's, that's just an argument for another, another forum. But, you know, our green image and our green image is paramount, paramount to our sales in all our sectors. And I think you know that we have to be careful with expansion that we don't lose that green image. And you know, labour and labour shortages. Um, I spoke to um, you know um, um, Senator Lombard. They referred to discussion groups, and I spoke to a discussion group there a couple of weeks ago. And by the time ten o'clock at night came, they were virtually all asleep in their chair. And. Um, Burnout after just three or four years of the abolition of quotas is becoming an issue out there with dairy farmers. And labour shortages and I suppose the profitability of the sector and the pressure that's on, on cash flow, but even the, the availability of, of um, qualified labour. 
But, um, you know, we were always told about New Zealand and the burnout, you know, the dairy farmers experienced there. But um, I see it in my, in, my, in my own locality that, you know, young fellas uh, are going to become old men very, very fast. And it, it, it's going to be a huge issue. And I suppose, you know, when I had another cap on, we talked about the, what was the the, the, the most... Fight, the most um, appropriate or what was the most economic unit for a one-man unit, how many cows that was to milk. And in my view, that has, has shot upwards um, to, a, to, a, to a stage where it is, where it might be, it might be the amount of cows that he wants to make a viable income, but whether it is the amount of work he can do is, is, a, different, is a different equation. So I'd just like to, what are Tigers' view on now? What is the, 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 what, what is the, you know, the most um, optimum figure of cows that a one-man unit could handle, and what, 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 he, what he can, what he can care for, it and um, what, what, you know, what should um, um, deliver a reasonable income for him. And just, you know, the bioeconomy and it links into climate change and the whole amount of research that's been done there. What's Tiger's input into that whole, whole bioeconomy? As a committee, we went out to meet um, prof um, the, 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 uh, Professor Kevin O'Connor and his colleagues in UCD there bef um, bef in June, in, in around June time. And there's huge, um, valuable research going on there. And there was an open day in, in, in the Sheen last Friday. And um, you know the strides that's been made in, in that area and making food more sustainable. What you know has Tigus is Tigus. One, is Tigers feeding into that research or have you an input into it? And I suppose, you know, I was often in the research centre in Moorpark and, you know, the, the great work that was done there, I suppose, in developing products for the market and, you know, it, 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 I, I, you know I haven't been there now in a number of years, but I presume that work is, 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 is going on a par. But I think the bioeconomy and that, you know, that faculty in UCD um, is, Tigers, is Tigers linked into that. And I suppose another thing as regards, you know, we're training young farmers and Deputy Penrose asked how many young, how many of the young farmers that you're training are going back to, to family farms. The availability of land for younger farmers and their, you know, their ability to get access to it. And, um, you know, the, we have an awful lot of different schemes in place, but, you know, I definitely see that there's larger and larger units of land being leased. And I think it's making it untenable for younger farmers to be able to take them. They're not able to compete with larger commercial outfits. And, um, you know, if we don't do something to give younger farmers access, availability to land and access to land, we can have the best educated young farmers in the business, but if they're not able to get access to land, um, you know, they're, they're, they're definitely not going to achieve their potential. And it's definitely an issue in my part of the country anyway. Land lease prices have, have, have shot up, but land has been leased in larger and larger blocks, and it's making it harder for young, young farmers to eat, if not, if not virtually impossible. And, you know, the other thing, the, the banks and their attitude and their availability of credit. And um, what I saw, you know, the, the ones that don't need it are able to get access to low cost credit. And the man that's starting off and does need a helping hand, he might get the credit, but he's getting it at a very high cost and, 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 and putting a huge burden on, 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 his, invest, on his investment, on, you know, on his investment plans. So, you know, have Tigers any views about, you know, what we should do as regards, I suppose, the, was the access to land and the access to credit for those younger farmers as well? Thanks, Deputy. We'll take the rest of the questions for us. That's okay. With Deputy McConnell is next, please. Thanks, Chairperson. I'd like to welcome uh, Mr. Hurley here and wish him well in his term as chairman. And also uh, welcome uh, CEO Jerry Boyle here today as well. Um, and just a few questions um, which you, you might comment on, um, Mr. Hurley. First of all, and to take up the point, the initial point that Deputy Cahill made as, re as well in relation to the climate change challenge and the, the Food Wise 2025. Um, targets. I'd be interested just to your f further perspective from you in relation to um, the the uh, 
juxtaposition of both of those, the targets versus actually the targets we have for climate change as well, um, and uh, how you see that evolving over, over the coming period. Um, you mentioned in your presentation in relation to the difficulty in terms of recruiting staff uh, and uh, the need to have additional flexibility and capacity to employ teaching staff as well, and the waiting lists in, within Chagas for part-time students, and that's a particular issue common, uh, I know, from uh, for Donegal students in recent times, where we have the very exceptional college that is Bally Hayes, um, but uh, there is uh, there is part-time courses as well in the county, um, and also particularly an issue in the west and the northwest in relation to waiting lists. Um, and I do think it is something that you need to be uh, empowered to recruit further. Uh, and uh, just uh, if you could elaborate further in relation to that, and um, uh, certainly uh, I think the committee at a committee level here we should support um, the objective of actually trying to ensure that those that you you can recruit and indeed that those waiting lists can be uh, addressed and that there wouldn't be a significant waiting times for, for young people who want to get into farming uh, to do a, a course. In relation to the fodder crisis, um, which obviously uh, Chagas have had a role in relation to monitoring over the last period of time, um, certainly the last month has been quite positive in that regard in terms of trying to address the gap, but I'd just be interested in your thoughts and your perspective um, uh, in terms of the winter ahead and uh, where Chagas stand at the moment with regard to that particular challenge in the months ahead. And then finally as well, in relation to the issue of, of advisors, and the capacity that Chogos has in relation to your advisor staff, uh, and certainly a, a common theme coming back from advisors is that, that they increasingly over recent years have had been bogged down and burdened by assisting farmers with applications and um, did, uh, participating in various programs and BPS applications and returns and administration to the extent that a lot of them are under pressure uh, with regard to actually offering farmers advice and being on the ground and, and I'd be interested in just your perspective in relation to that uh, because ultimately uh, um, a lot of the engagement farmers have is will be with your advisor capacity and, and that's quite important. I know an understanding as well that there has been a growing, a growing um, uh, uh, growth in relation to private advisors in, in, in recent times. Coramayag. Next Deputy, uh, Deputy Pingle, please. Thanks, Chairman. Um, I'd like to just take this opportunity to wish Mr. Harley well as Chairman of uh, Chagas and, um, and the work that you, uh, is ongoing. And apologies, maybe if the, some of these questions might be repeating a wee bit, but everybody's doing the, the question for us. So, um, just, I would like to just Ask, ask in relation to climate change specifically and the role that Chagas is playing. Um, I see a lot, a lot of the research, I've just looked at quickly through the research that you do on your website and that there, and a lot of it's very early stage, um, or it appears to be kind of early stage, just finding out the extent of the problems. And I'm just wondering what climate change mitigation measures and, and research should be carrying out in the future, because I think we all know that it's vitally important that the uh, agriculture uh, participates in the, whatever mitigation we can put in place, um, because that, that is very important and it's going to be even more important in the years to come. So I'd just like to hear your views just in relation to that and what you would actually see happening. Um, and and maybe, maybe I'm wrong in, look at, in looking at the, the research that you're doing at the moment as to the extent of it, but I'd, and maybe if you could expand on that for me, because I think it's, it's very important. And just in relation to, I'd be interested in just your comment there in relation to the capital requirements of Chagas and how you would see that um, actually being met, um, I, because I, I would be worried, um, and I think the I could be wrong, but uh, from reading between the lines and what I see there, you're talking about maybe about private sector involvement or something like that there, and I'd be worried in relation to that because I think um, Chagas should have a, a, an independent role, and uh, I'm just wondering what you see as how that's going to be addressed, and are you looking for solely at public sector addressing it? Thank you. Next Deputy, uh, Senator Mulherm, please. Yes, uh, I also want to wish uh, Mr Hurley well in his new position. and. <coughs> Um, just a couple of questions. Um, just, I suppose, on the whole issue of climate change, which has been referred to, um, clearly when the whole concept of supporting agriculture cap was established going back a number of decades ago, it was about quality, affordable, traceable food. And now we've, the, the farmers and agriculture has also got uh, to take on board environmental uh, obligations. 
and as we know more about science and I suppose the interaction of, of human beings with the environment. A lot of talk uh, has been about, you know, culling the national herd and uh, extreme suggestions of veganism and all this sort of thing, but I'd just like maybe to ground the debate a bit more, and I think, Professor Boyle, you've been pretty upfront about the situation and our climate change targets with agriculture. And I suppose in many ways for farmers, even though great strides have been made since the early 1990s, in, in reducing carbon emissions, and we are leaders in, in many respects, uh, the herd has increased, and that's, that's the, the, the consequent difficulty. But when I hear alternatives, people talk about planting, you know, re reducing um, uh, ca the cattle stock in the country, they talk about planting lands, but at the end of the day we're talking about food and I don't hear too much about where we're going to get protein from or the suitability. I never hear anybody say well let's plant a load of uh, beans here that people can eat or and my understanding is it's a precarious endeavour especially for food in this country so you know I, I don't think a full picture has been uh, established in relation to the fact that we produce uh, um, or the full message isn't out there that we produce food in a carbon efficient manner and what are the alternatives? I mean, taking food from some country in the tropics that happens to grow beans or other uh, protein uh, food crops efficiently is also a carbon uh, footprint. And obviously there's also the, the issue that if we, for some reason, got out of beef, some other country will move to, to fill that, that gap. And I, I just, maybe th there's, there's some comments you can make in relation to that, uh, Professor Boyle. Um, as I say, I think sometimes we lose sight in, you know, I suppose in some, in some ways there's a lot of hysteria around climate change and I mean we just have to deal with it but we kind of crush people in the process is my view. The other issue I, I wanted to ask you about is, I know that Chagask has been very proactive in, in as regards soil management and training uh, farmers how to get, to get the most out of soil um, and in particular maximising grassland production. But <coughs> considering, I suppose, recent, the last number of years and weather events, I know we can call them extreme weather, but weather seems to be all the more precarious. I'm wondering, do, do you actually chart at what point we can, all, we can produce so much fodder, we can produce so much grass, and if we have stocking levels beyond that, and this is aside from reducing carbon emissions, at what point we can't actually feed our own animals? And, and what is that point, if you've done that, or what, what sort of... Uh, studies are undertaken. And just finally, um, I had the, the pleasant experience last Friday night at being at um, a Green Cert awarding ceremony in Mayo and it was great to see all the people who turned out and their families and all the work that the, the course participants put in and were very proud rightly to receive their Green Certs. But it just struck me um, going forward and it's on the whole issue of land mobility, how many people actually undertake farming courses um, with Chagas but don't have land or are hoping to get land or you know I'm not talking about maybe you know your dad is or your mum is going to leave your land but people who are, are a step removed and are just in the hope uh, or how many are actually maybe doing the course and hope to get into the food industry in some area um, as opposed to going into farming just maybe a breakdown if you have those figures uh, just to get a picture of, um, you know, and, and do you know how many people are actually waiting for land? And actually how many people outside of a farming background altogether undertake, uh, you know, the Green Cert course? Because um, it would strike me, it's mainly you're from a farming tradition, you do, you, you enter agriculture then. Thanks. Thanks, Senator. Uh, before I, Deputy Fitzmaurice, do you want to make a contribution? Yeah, you're next, yeah. Um, First of all, so, sorry, before, before I let you in, just a result, but my members were dealing today with the Chairman designate of, of uh, Tagus, not specifically general Tagus matters as such. We can have Tagus back in at a later stage, maybe to discuss their annual report, which will obviously generate plenty of discussion as well. So we're just dealing with one particular matter today as such. Sorry, Deputy. Uh, thanks for the opportunity, Chairman. Um, first of all, uh, best to look to you. Um, I'd just like to know your thoughts on, say, with the likes of the beef genomic scheme, I would like to know your thoughts on um, the situation in relation to where your thoughts are going forward on 
say the stock and rate with the line of you see where beef is at the moment do we need your thoughts on the factory feedlots uh, do you think it's distorting the market um, your thoughts on um, at the moment Chagas do a lot of research and they're very good at it in fairness and I spoke to Jerry numerous times um, they have cross hired the likes of FRS for different for doing gloss and that down the road where they hadn't the men powered themselves to be quite honest about it because the lost people. Um, should there not be a situation where the likes of the ACA or private planners could come together and tender for that? Uh, do you think that that would be an opportunity? Um, a question for you that so you do, obviously Chagas gets uh, subsidised from the, the state. Um, and look at Jerry would argue down through the years they weren't getting enough um, for research and for all the different uh, programs that they put together. But for anyone to use the likes of Carbon Navigator or use that type of services from them in a private capacity, you have to pay fees um, in, in, if you are a planner. I like your thoughts on that. Um, your thoughts on the willow and the forestry side of it. There seems to be a big, you know, there's figures coming out about Willow and that at the moment, and we know farmers on the ground in County Mead that have pulled land, have actually dug it up and said it's not effective. I'd like to know your thoughts on that. Your, where do you stand um, in your views on the young farmer? I know that there's a new scheme being written for the young farmers at the moment. Um, I'd like to know your thoughts on the cap, and would you agree that we need to go back to the scenario um, because of factory feedlots and the markets being distorted, especially in the beef sector, your thoughts on the suckler herd, how to make sure that it's saved, and would you agree that we need an acre of green land to keep Ireland um, basically, when we're selling ourselves abroad, and we are, we, we, we rear a lot of our stock out of grass, but uh, there's questions being asked in Europe, to put it blunt at the moment about how we're reared in some of our beef stock and um, would you agree that we need a, for every unit that we need an acre of green land when we're applying for be it cap or be it um, under our nitrates scenario? There were just a few questions that I have for you. Thanks, uh, Deputy. Now, Mr Hurley, we're back to you on others. Some fairly general questions there that we may leave for another day when we're discussing the Tigers Annual Report, that's okay. But maybe you can address some of the points that were addressed to you directly. I think, first of all, I thank you all very much for those questions. In the first instance, I will deal with, you know, you all mentioned the whole area of climate change. And I think from my point of view, and very much from the point of view of, we say, from a TAGUS perspective, as I see it there, you know, the train has left the station there. And I think, you know, farming for the future, both from an image and from a sustainability point of view, I think climate change is here. I think we've got to embrace it. And I think instead of a curse in the dark, I think it is important that we embrace it from a positive perspective. And I think, you know, uh, one, uh, one particular person was a query uh, whether or not we have to, we say, decrease stocking figures and all of those, we say, to stay within the limits. I would like to look at it from the point of view of, I think, from, to ensure that agriculture is sustainable, I think, I would say, from three pillars. It has to be sustainable from a perspective of you know, staying within the ambit of climate change, staying within the ambit of the overall sustain sustainability piece, from, and that covers the whole area of water quality as well and the whole area of, of the environment. But as well as that, agriculture has to be sustainable from a profit and profit margin perspective to ensure that we have viable farm entities. So I think to ensure all of that is what has tagged the role, and I would see it very much in the area of mitigation, what measures are we putting in place from the point of view of mitigating carbon emission to ensure that we have a vibrant agri-sector for, for the future. And that certainly is, I suppose we said the big issue at the moment would be dairy sector, and I think it is important to recognise, and I come from a dairy background, to recognise that dairy is the area that would be most challenged in that area by virtue of the high stock densities. Uh, and, but what are we doing there? First of all, maybe the soft options, what can we do with them? And I would say there, one would be the whole area of mixed recording to make sure that we have, and allied to that would be the whole area of EBI. 
to ensure that we have profitable and highly performing with the animals within the herd. But equally what is important is that we encourage more forestry within our farms, particularly in the dairying area, and also maybe looking at the whole area of the replacement of fossil fuels, fuels from uh, an energy credit perspective. I am conscious that when it comes with, say, to the whole area of carbon emission, that we are lumped in with three other areas, the whole area of, of um, energy, residential and transport. But I think from an agri point of view, we've got to be responsible for areas that are within our ambit. And obviously we say, I suppose, with the, the two big uh, game changers, if we were to make it very significant, a reduction would be changing from the area of can to stabilised urea. There is science based there and a lot of work is being done on that at the moment. And the other area is, you know, we all grew up in the area with spreading slurry by the splash plate system. Now we're moving to the area of um, the injector system, or maybe more recently, we said the dribble bar, but I think moving to the area of the splash plate, moving to the area of the injector system would have huge areas there as well. So I think we've got to be we've got to be positive and proactive. And I believe we've got to combine with the two areas. We must to ensure that we have a vibrant agriculture and a vibrant sector that will feed off agriculture. It is important that we achieve the growth targets that were set in Food West 2025. And Tagus role there is, as a scientific independent researcher to look at the mitigating effects that we can have a two-pronged approach, ensure that we have a vibrant agriculture, but equally that we embrace carbon climate from a positive perspective as well, because that is something that is upon us, we owe to ourselves and to the next generation as well. Many people would have raised the issue in relation to um, um, and, and just maybe we said to deal with them in the order that they were uh, dealt with. Uh, Deputy Pembroke, he just made the point in relation to, first of all, we said the Kilkenny Farm, just to explain to you that it is something, it's a programme that I would be very passionate about when I was chairman of the Glenbia, of the Glenbia Group. I was its first, its first chairman. Uh, I think uh, it has three stakeholders. I think it is important to remember that Tagus has done a splendid job there. It is a research entity. And if there are mistakes to be made on it, it is a research farm. And the lessons to be learned there are that they cannot be replicated uh, by the weather farming community. To date, it has explained everything in detail what's happening in relation to turnout date, the number of kilos that are fed, nice rest that are to be used. Do appreciate that there was an issue there in relation to, or in, should, I, should I say, um, an air of concern in relation to the bad weather, the snowy period we've had in early uh, spring. On that point, did communicate with the committee here earlier yeah. in the year in that regard, uh, and explain in a fair bit of detail exactly what yes. happened to yes. the storm and, and so on. So and forth. A, report, a report is being prepared and it will be issued in the very near future. Okay. So I think I would think I want to assure you that all of that is under control. A report is being prepared and will be, re, will be released in the very near future. Uh, there was reference made, we said, to the whole area of the Vista Milk Centre that was recently launched. I think that is hugely important, particularly for our young farmers. The fact that we are in a digital age, we need to uh, communicate appropriately with our younger farmers. Um, in relation to education, and I think that was actually covered by a number of people, and I would have to be upfront and say to Deputy McGonagall that we do appreciate in your specific area the waiting list is higher than it is in other areas, and we are very conscious and focused on addressing that area, but I am aware that the number on the waiting list is higher in your area than in other areas. So it is important. I want to upfront say that we, we uh, do recognise that. Um, in relation to uh, many of the questions that would have been asked in relation to our 57, 56 million of income, uh, I don't have, but I think we will get back to you in relation we say, to that. We can, we can deal with that. That is obviously made up of a whole combination of areas. The important thing is that it is there and hopefully growing. And I think we certainly will come back to you uh, in that particular area. We can deal with that issue when we're dealing with the annual report. Definitely, okay? definitely, yes. Um, Deputy Cahill, he dealt with the area of was it, climate change. I think I would have dealt with that. Um, the whole area, in your own area of uh, Lachine, 
you, I do know that we said Glanby would be very involved in that area. It deals with the whole area of bio uh, uh, transformation. I think it is a very important project uh, where we said Glanby, Enterprise Ireland are involved in that and the whole area of science and development. In relation to, and many people would have covered the whole area of, we say, staff embargo and the need for, we say, staff for the future. And I think, um, uh, Senator Lumber, you actually made, you queried the whole area of, we say, the age profile as well. Uh, in relation to, I suppose, uh, and that is the reason why we need to be conscious of it, whether the number of the age profile of farms, that was something we've always had. And I think it is something that I think you know that is something that we cannot change, but certainly encourage and have a program in place where we educate our young farms, our young farmers, and ensure that they have the appropriate training to avail of the very important uh, stamp duty mitigation, the, the stamp duty that is there, and also the very important um, benefit that is there from the point of view of land, um, um, uh, I think it's called, the, the, the whole area of the capital allowance that are available in relation to land transfer. That is something that is hugely important. It is available and promoted by successive governments, but equally from a TAGIS point of view, we have got to make sure that we have the appropriate, we say, staff in place to make sure that our farmers have the appropriate, we say, green certificate facility to avail of that. A query was asked in relation to what number of people we say get back we say to uh, full-time farming. I don't have that, I, and, and I think that can actually be dealt with. We can come back to that as well. But I think what is hugely important is that we don't have to have. Not everybody will have to be or will want to be a full-time farmer, right? And I think depending on the area we live in, depending on the farm size, I think it is. One thing that is hugely important is that you know farmers living in rural Ireland, whether they be full-time or part-time, is what is hugely important. Because by having people living in rural Ireland, that is one thing that will ensure that we have a sustainable and a vibrant rural community. And as chairman of TAGUSC, and this is something that TAGUSC we are hugely uh, conscious of. Whether it be if we don't have farmers living in rural Ireland, I think it is well recognised. And where a different hat is oftentimes maybe from a Glenview point of view, the figure that would always have been raised is that for every one euro that's invested within the farm, it generates four euro within the wider economy. So agriculture is something that is hugely important to within the farm and indeed outside the farm gate as well. Um, uh, Deputy Fitzmaurice, you mentioned uh, the area of uh, factory feedlots. I think, from a TAGUS point of view, I think, personal view, I think, you know, whether I like it or not, I'm wearing a TAGUS hat today, and we do not get involved with like, in policy issues of of of, uh, of of that particular nature. You did make the point about my personal view on CAP. CAP is something that is hugely important to us. And for me personally, I was aware that the cap payment, I got a text on my mobile phone on the 16th of October to say that it was available in my bank account. You can rest assured that I immediately checked my bank statement and it wasn't there. Checked it, checked it again at 12 o'clock. It still wasn't there, but the important thing was that it had arrived safe and sound at 9 o'clock the following morning. So I think irrespective of size or scale, cap is something that is hugely important and hugely important from the point of view of the whole area of environmental behaviour of farmers as well, and make sure that all of us as farmers farm within the code of practice as we ought to do. Um, in relation to the suckler farm, farmer, whether we should have um, uh, one acre per livestock unit or not, I think irrespective, pardon? Pardon? All farmers. All far I think, you know, depending on the counties we live in, I think we have at the moment um, what we call a nitrous derogation, and that is something that is hugely important. And I think that is something that is hugely important, I think, for the future of dairying in particular. 
other farmers we say do not have to avail uh, of that level of derogation because of a lower stock intensity and that is something that I would be conscious of. Um, I think there, there are uh, very uh, many other questions. I think, um, you know, two areas, you know, that, uh, that I would see as being hugely important for, I think, we'll say me as chairman of TAGISC. One thing I'm very conscious of is that dairy farming is very much what I would call the engine of, you know, sustainable, profitable agriculture. And that is something that can, you know, sort of can, can spread out into other areas as well, whether it be tillage farmers assisting the dairy farmer in growing animal crop, whether it be some of our existing beef farmers, you know, supporting uh, our dairy farmers by way of heifer rearing. It's the focus of Tagus must be sustainable farming systems. Not everybody will want to get up in the morning and milk cows, nor should they, right? But equally, they can tap into the, into the daring sector from, from the point of view of a sustainable future, and I think that is what is important. Um, in relation to willow farming, uh, I'm, I'm not exactly sure of that, but I do know that many, many schemes are driven by grants that are available from, from Brussels, so I think I will have to uh, kick for touch on that one, if you, if, you, uh, if you don't mind, because there is no point that I want to, that I want to be speaking about something that I do not know about. But a few areas, daring is hugely important. One thing I am concerned about, and I think Tagus needs to be concerned about it as well, if we speak about the sustainability of the maximum number of farmers, I think the low level of profitability of beef farming is an issue of concern, and I think we need to be very conscious of it. There is no point in having farmers who say, one thing I would be hugely conscious of as the father of five children myself, where one of them is at home farming. A farmer that stays at home farming on a full-time basis, that person must have the very same opportunity as earning a viable, earning a viable livelihood and income as his siblings that would have gone on and have, have had a professional career in another sector. So I think that is something that, is something that I, would be, I would be very, very conscious of. Education in farming is something that is hugely important. Tagus must keep abreast with that, and that is the reason why I am so conscious of the we recruit the brightest and the best and endeavour to retain them. We cannot retain all of them, but we live in a digital era, and we need young people that are well capable of communicating with our younger farmers in particular, because whether it be the young Tagusk advisor, they are the future of Tagusk. The young farmer is the future of agriculture, and things are changing. Farming practices are changing. Uh, some one of you, I think, mentioned about in relation to the apprenticeship schemes that we are about to embrace, what type of farmer will be there? We need a farmer that is high spec, embracing technology, whether it be grass measurement, whatever the case may be, but equally interchanging in a very important way with the Moor Park researchers, where that is actually fed into the apprenticeship scheme as well. In relation to labour, Labour is something that is hugely important on farms. I think it was Deputy Cahill made the point. And in relation to one-man units, I think you know, it's not for me to say what is the appropriate number of animals or the number of cows for one person to operate. Oftentimes, it is dictated by the level of borrowings on the farm. No two farms are the same. Oftentimes, it can be dictated by the level of our farm, whether there's a spouse working our farm or not. So no two, no two are the same. But one thing I would be very conscious of is that labour and the availability of labour is hugely important, particularly in an Irish context. And I would say on our own particular farm, uh, where I would have spent many years as being chairman of Glanbia, and, and, and it, I didn't have, uh, or should I say we didn't have one of our own family farming at that particular time, I was very fortunate that we had good staff uh, they were with us from Poland, they were non-Irish people, and they're still with us today. So non-nationals coming to Ireland is something that is hugely important, because as we are aware, that was something that had been mentioned, I think, to me quite recently, 
the building boom is about to get going again, and that certainly will take with the people from the agri space, as it did in the past. So, non non Irish workers are something that is that are hugely important. But equally, it is important that they be well paid, well accommodated, and well treated within the agri sector to ensure that we have continuity of supply there. Two two points: um, the capital requirements issue and the issue of the fodder crisis during the year and where we are at the moment in that regard. Have you had any kind of update on the, the, the data that may be available as regards what fodder is available today compared to what it was maybe in July? Things have improved considerably in the past number of months and even last week there was some fodder saved, I would imagine. Yeah, it's, you know, it's amazing what... Sorry. Was that your own? No, mine was on earlier in the year, it's, 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 it's amazing. It's amazing, you know, what, 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 a fine, what a fine spell of weather will do, you know. And uh, so very seriously, they're prob probably depending on areas, and no two farms are the same. But, uh, you know, possibly uh, the drier areas, you know, and I live, we say, down south in one of the drier areas, and, you know, in my particular area, um, the, you know, appeasement that has happened, you know, with third-cut silage, all of that area has been absolutely enormous. So I've no doubt that in some areas there is still a deficit, but it certainly has been, and that is something that Tagusk, through its, uh, you know, during the, the key period, would have played a hugely important role, meeting with farmer groups, the budgeting, and dealing with the issue. So Tagusk have been exceptionally proactive in that area in dealing with encouraging farmers, getting them to do their appropriate measurements and dealing with the deficit. So, in some areas there is still a shortfall, but in many areas I think um, a, a very, you know, acceptable back end has certainly, we say, filled that gap enormously. In relation to the capital budget, I suppose that is something that is, I would be, you know, concerned coming from, we said, the private sector. And, you know, Tagusk is unusual there. Uh, not having access, we said, to, to, you know, to additional funds, so to speak. I'm not for a moment suggesting that Tagus should 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 skip away from under the under the the ambit of you know strict and careful fiscal policy. It shouldn't. But having said that, in the past we have been you know selling you know sites or selling farms that were no longer, we say, uh, needed. And they were there, you know, we say, to fund some of our very important capital projects. And I'm looking at an example, we say, right now we actually spoke about, and all of you spoke about education. Education and dealing with the whole green cert issue is something that is hugely important. I'm glad to say that in the past, government gave us the green light to recruit in excess of 40 staff members to deal with that very pressing issue. We obviously will be looking at the continuation of that. And that is something that is hugely important to us to ensure that we can fulfil our educational needs to deal with the whole area of Green Start movement for a variety of reasons. But you know, not having access, we say, to an overdraft facility within the framework of strict fiscal governance is an impediment from the point of view of dealing with the objectives that are on us. And one of those very important objectives at the moment is the whole area of climate change, because that is the new, what I would call the new kid on the block. We've got to operate within it, but I think, rather than curse in the dark, I think we've got to deal with it from a positive, progressive, pro, pro, uh, positive and progressive perspective in dealing with it in the whole mitigating area. But we need people, appropriate scientists, to deal with that area in a positive way as well. Okay. Thanks very much, Mr. Harrity. Sorry. Um, Sorry, I, could, I could just ask about that uh, money, capital requirements that you were talking about. How do you see it being resolved? Is it solely through the public realm? Uh, I, I think, I think we say my, my area today is we say to raise, raise the issue with you. Uh, it is something that I feel that is hugely important. And I would like to think you know, that our, our management team, you know, me as, as chairman of the authority, is not for me we say, to say it can be resolved by A, B, or C. I think that is the role for said, the director and his team. But I was coming from once I joined, we said the board and sat down 
uh, with the key people, with, with, with uh, Professor Boyle and his team. I think a blind person would identify that as being an issue. You know, you cannot have TAGUS will have to be a progressive entity as well. Very much no different to a commercial entity that has to grow itself and has to be fit for purpose. And that is certainly, as I would see it, is a very clear impediment for the future. And of course, coupled with that as well, is the area of the, you know, the issue in retaining, in attracting and recruiting key people. Because TAGDISC is an outstanding organisation, but no different to any other entity. It's only as good as the people that are there to lead it at any particular time. And in recruiting, you know, we've got to recruit really good people because they are the leaders of tomorrow. And that it is an impediment, you know, the pay cap that is there. Um, and, and I think that is something that can be tweaked uh, without, blowing the without, without creating any issue. Because oftentimes you recruit a, a key person for a key position, and that person may be a leader for the future who may have, you know, completed their PhD or may have worked in the private sector. And I think it is, you know, either uh, appropriate or, you know, it makes no sense. You, we just simply cannot recruit talented young people at a very low pay scale. And I think, you know, a degree of tweaking can be done there without getting involved in the area of unions or overstepping the area of management. But if we are to attract the key people for the future, uh, the low entry level is not sustainable or inappropriate for the future. Um, yeah, yeah, just briefly, I mean, that all comes down to money, and what my question was supposed to was about where do you see that money coming from? Do you see it public, as public money, or do you see it as private money? I think, I think we will come, we'll, I, 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 think, I think that is an area that I will get Professor Boyle and his team with a defeat. On that point, without cutting across, I suppose, I think we'll have the targets, uh, our preventative uh, from, the, I see Professor Boyle is mad to get in here, but... <laughs> But today we're only dealing with the chairman designate, uh, and we will have Tagus back discussing the annual report before Christmas, I would oh, yes. uh, And we'll have a bit more opportunity, I suppose, Professor O'Boyle will have his team with him that particular day, and we can go into it in more detail mm -hmm. with regards to all those issues that have been highlighted today, in particular, I think, the, the capital requirement, the, the staffing levels. They're huge issues for the future, I think, and it requires a different day, in my opinion, uh, to deal with it in more detail. So I think I look forward to doing that maybe before Christmas. Not, not trying to get away from your point. Well, 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 the chairman raised, raised yeah. issues himself, like, and that's why I was asking the questions. So the chairman, well, well, well I suppose, I suppose from a, my role, and, yeah, okay, yeah. like. yeah. and and I, I would certainly see it as being, you know, very much from from the point of view of public money, because you know we can only get so much we say from yeah. uh, effectively we say contracts we win, you know, they've got to be funded as well. So I would see it very much we say from the point of view of public money. But today, in my role as chairman. I was almost a, a bit apologetic, as I said, being in only a wet week, but I've got to identify the three, be bold enough, I think I would not be doing uh, my role justice if I wasn't bold enough to identify, we said, the three key areas that I see that are an issue for the future. And I would like you to take note of those, okay. and I've absolutely no doubt that we will be back, we said, looking at those areas and discussing with you in your role as uh, deputies and senators because I think you've got, in your areas, you are the people on the ground as well. You want a progressive and dynamic agriculture and an appropriate tag, as we said, to lead agriculture for the future. So I would like to think that we're all joined at the hip in that area. Okay, yeah, no, there are three areas that we can identify when we come back to discuss the annual report, as well as other issues in the report. But yeah. those three, we can highlight those three issues. Is that all right? Any other questions that we finish it before we finish up? Okay, thank you very much, Mr. Herrera, uh, Mr. O'Boyle, for coming before us today. I'd like to wish you well in your, your new role. As you say you're only a wet week in the job, but I'm sure you'll have many more wet days to come in the job over the next period of time. And we look forward to engaging with you on a, on a regular basis in the years and months and years to come. Thank you very much for coming before us today. Thank you, Chairman. Uh, that's uh, as we, we, suspend, we suspend the meeting for the next couple of minutes until we get the next group of witnesses in before us. Thank you very much.
Before we begin, can I remind members, as per normal, to, and witnesses to make sure the mobile phones are completely turned off, please. Uh, today we are dealing with engaging with Mr Frank Lyon, who is the chairman designate of Board Nagon, and listening to his uh, presentation with regard to where he sees the board going up next period of time. Uh, before we begin, I want to bring to your attention witnesses are protected by absolute privilege and respective evidence to give to the committee. However, if directed by the committee to cease giving evidence, the relation to Pigsham and you continue to do so, you're entitled thereafter only to qualify privilege in respect of your evidence. You are directed that only evidence connected with the subject matter of these be given, and you are asked to respect the parliamentary practice to the effect that where possible you should not criticise the main charge against any person or entity, but name in such ways to make him or her identifiable. Members are reminded of long standing parliamentary practice to the effect that members should not comment on or criticise the main charge against either person outside the House or an official leader by name in such ways to make him or her identifiable. Mr. Nine, I now ask to make your opening statement, please, and then we'll take questions from the members. Thank you, Chairman, members. Um, Thank you for the invitation to attend before you today. As you're aware, I was nominated Chairman of the Irish Greyhound Board on the 6th of September 2018. I'm a solicitor by profession. I'm currently the State Solicitor for Cork City. I'm a Fellow of the Chartered Institute of Arbitrators and an accredited, accredited mediator. I've served as a Vice Chairman of the Employment Appeals Tribunal. I'm a member of the panel of chairpersons of the Mental Health Tribunals, and I'm also a statutory arbitrator appointed pursuant to Section 23 of the Animal Health and Welfare Bovine Tuberculosis Regulations 2015. I live in Mallow, and I'm from Clonmel. I've served as President of the North and East Cork Bar Association. I've been President of the Mallow Chamber of Commerce of the Mallow Rotary Club and Chairman of Mallow GA and the Mallow Rugby Club. I remain Chairman of the Management Committee of the Mallow GA Complex, which I understand remains the largest GA complex constructed outside of Dublin. Uh, my interest in greyhounds is primarily uh, through my father, Sean Nyhan, and also from the fact that I come from Clonmel, which regards itself as the true home of the greyhound industry in Ireland. We were a traditional two greyhound family, which we raised in the local Clonmel track with very occasional trips further afield when merited. At a later stage, I was a member of a syndicate that owned a number of greyhounds that raced in Cork and Tralee with very limited success. I have served for the last three years as a member of the Irish Greyhound Board. It's fair to say that the greyhound industry has experienced challenging times and continues to do so. But I'm satisfied that we are making progress. Greyhound racing has a long history and is part of the culture and social fabric of the entire community. It is a strong rural base, particularly associated with the farming community, and it also enjoys strong support from the urban areas where our stadia are located. The board, prompted by this committee, commissioned Jim Power Economics in 2017 to undertake an assessment of the financial and economic impact of the Irish greyhound industry. This study was a follow-up to a previous assessment undertaken by the same group in April 2011. The published report demonstrates that while there has been a downturn in the overall industry since 2011, the greyhound industry remains a very significant and strong industry, supporting over 5,000 direct and indirect jobs with over 7,000 owners, and delivers an economic impact of the order of €300 million Euro to the national economy. This level of impact cannot be underestimated, particularly in rural areas, and the industry remains an important contributor to sustained rural development, which is a state of objective for semi-state bodies. Members of this committee will be aware that various studies have been undertaken in our industry in recent years, culminating with your report in January of 2016. We in Bordnagon have addressed the cumulative recommendations of these reports, and we have assigned the necessary resources for implementation. I had a pleasure earlier this year with Dr Colm Gaynor of appearing before you on the pre-legislative scrutiny of the Greyhound Industry Bill, uh, which has recently been published and, in fact, I think is before the Shannon as we speak. Uh, it is clear that an updating of the 1958 Greyhound Industry Act is very much needed to provide a modern and legislative framework for the industry. The new bill will strengthen proper governance and give statutory effect to the code of practice for the governance of state bodies. It will give greater specificity and enhance the, ex the, existi enhance the existing regulatory powers in the area of sales, training and the racing of greyhounds, with particular reference to doping. It contains provisions to enable Board Nagon to develop a real-time traceability system, either alone or in cooperation with others, for racing greyhounds, so as to identify those in possession of greyhounds and attribute accountability directly to them. The new Act will also place the Control Committee and the Appeals Committee on a statutory basis and will include measures to improve the enforcement of penalties. During, 19, during 2017, sorry, the Board spent a considerable amount of time in formulating a new strategic plan for the industry for the period 2018 to 2022. 
This plan was the subject of an industry-wide consultation process and also had regard to the studies already undertaken. The plan focuses on seven key pillars of activity, comprising three areas of growth, growing owners and breeders, growing total and wagering activity and growing attendances. These three growth areas are underpinned by four foundation pillars, namely integrity and regulation, high welfare standards, organisational structures and information technology. This plan was approved by the Department of Agriculture, Food and the Marine, and since its publication in March of 2018, we have begun to progress the many actions that are required under the plan. Provided we can achieve our funding targets annually, we would, with the implementation of the initiatives set out in the strategic plan, be running a fair, transparent and highly regulated sport, offering a top-class experience across all our stadia, supported by a single committed and innovative Irish Greyhound board team, where the Greyhound will always come first. The sale of the Harles Cross Greyhound Stadium finalised in May of this year, and this has enabled the Board to deal with long-term debt issues. And for the first time in many years, we have funding for investment in track infrastructure and the wider industry. The surplus proceeds from the sale amounted to approximately €6 million, Euro, and these have been subject to a detailed business plan approved by the Minister for Agriculture, Food and the Marine and the Minister for Public Expenditure and Reform. The plan provides for a €3 million Euro investment in Shelburne Park to bring this facility up to the expectation of the modern users and customers, with the lesser sums to be expended on Corraheen Park and other stadium improvements and a possible redevelopment in Kilkenny, together with a million €1 million for significant upgrades in information technology. One of the key areas for attention within the strategic plan is a systematic review of the industry footprint. The Board is committed to conducting a strategic review of all stadia to determine the industry footprint for the future. I am pleased to advise that the tender process to appoint an independent party to undertake this review has commenced. The review will of necessity involve extensive consultation with stakeholders and we would expect a final report by March of 2019. Communication within and outside the industry has long been identified as a challenge for Board Nagon. The National Greyhound Consultative Forum was established under my predecessor, Phil Meany, in 2016, with the aim of engagement with representatives of the wider industry, and this forum now meets on a quarterly basis. It provides an invaluable mechanism for the Board to consult with stakeholders and for, to make proposals for change within the industry. It also allows stakeholders to raise concerns directly with the Board and the Executive. A range of issues have been dealt with through this forum to date, including the Greyhound grading system, welfare issues and the fixture and events calendar. The Board has also put in place a communication arrangement with our Octus members, and briefings have taken place in November 2017 and May of this year. It is our intention to continue this information and dialogue. We have recognised Brexit as a key challenge for us, as the United Kingdom represents the principal market for greyhound sales. There is also ongoing transportation of greyhounds to participate in competitions in the UK, or for UK-based greyhounds to participate in competitions in Ireland. As recently as the 26th of September of this year, we considered this issue in detail at the National Greyhound Consultative Forum, and we were fortunate to have a presentation from an officer of the Brexit section of the Department of Agriculture, Food and the Marine. Following from same, we will arrange for affected sections of our industry to engage with the Department so that the final shape of any Brexit arrangement can satisfactorily meet the needs of the industry. I have some personal priorities for the next five years. By the end of my term, I would expect that the Greyhound Industry Act would be fully operational, that Greyhound welfare would be a priority throughout the industry, and I want to have improved the cohesion among the stakeholders so that attendances at all our stadia have increased significantly. A colleague recently reminded me of the words of Henry, of Henry Ford, coming together is beginning, keeping together is progress, but working together is success. In conclusion, Chairman, I wish to acknowledge the work of this committee on matters relating to the Irish Greyhound industry and your ongoing support in relation to resourcing and improving SAM. I thank you for the invitation to attend here today. I hope to continue to work with this committee and its members in progressing and uh, addressing the issues affecting the Irish Greyhound industry. And I'm happy to deal as best I can with any questions. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Mann. Deputy Cahill. Thank you, thank you, Chairman. First of all, I'd like to welcome the new Chairman here and thank you for his presentation. And I suppose I'd like to put on record the work of the previous outgoing Chairman, Finn Meany, who I think um, steered, steered the industry to a difficult period and, and, and steered it very well. There was just a number of points I'd, I'd like to make, and I think, you know, our greyhound industry is under pressure. I think there's no point in denying that. Um, you know, attendance are falling, um, dog numbers are falling, and, um, you know, I think uh, uh, some... some we, we, we need to get more imaginative to, to try, to try and, uh, and keep, it in, to keep it in place and to keep it in business. 
and I suppose, you know, I'm a director of a, of, of a privately owned Greyhound track, and I see at first hand how difficult it is for, for a track to, to break even and to stay in business. I think, you know, the welfare and the welfare issues, I suppose, the previous thing we were talking about climate change in the previous presentation, I think um, welfare and dog welfare is, is, is an elephant in the room, and it's an issue that has to be addressed and, and, and addressed satisfactorily if, if our industry is to prosper and survive. And I think, you know, a lot of dog owners, I think when they talk about welfare, I think they think it is about the sand and the track and the racing surface. Unfortunately, you know, fortunate welfare goes an awful lot further than that, and it's the life of the greyhound after he finishes racing and the way, the way that he, he's going to be looked after. And, um, you know, but on the course side and the track side, um, you know, there's, there's a lot of issues that need to be addressed here. Now, I appreciate the board have, you know, to have um, directed money on, on towards, towards, animal, towards dog welfare. But I think, you know, more needs to be done and we have to get the public out there to recognise that, you know, dogs are being looked after extremely well and they're extremely well cared for. And I think of our industry's progress, we have to win that battle. And I think at the moment, we're definitely not winning it. And I think it leads into the whole issue of regulation and the enforcement of, regula of regulation. And I think, you know, it links, in, it links into um, um, dog welfare. And unfortunately, our industry has got a name for, you know, um, malpractices being, being, being adhered to. And even then when a malpractice is found, that the, the board have an inability to enforce penalties and fines. Now, hopefully, the new grey bill, and you know, as we sit here, it has been discussed in the Senate. Hopefully, it will go to address these issues, and it's a necessity that these issues are addressed. Um, there can be no place in our industry for people who are breaking rules or who are using substances that are banned. And um, I think it's absolutely essential that we're seen as being an industry that doesn't tolerate any, any, uh, any um, breaking of rules and regulations. And I think, you know, that has to be enforced and uh, hopefully when this new bill comes into place that, that you know, that, that can be done. But I couldn't stress to you, uh, 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 Mr. Nguyen, the importance with the public of winning this battle. We've had too many headlines of, of, of you know, dogs being found with substances and no sanctions have been taken um, against the trainer, no sanctions have been able to be enforced against the trainer. And, you know, we've had it on very high profile nights within the industry, and it has done us a serious, serious amount of harm. And, you know, we have to get beyond that. And, you know, in your term as chairman, I would, you know, I would stress to you that, you know, regulation and to make sure that the regulation is in place and enforced and that they will restore public confidence that everything is, is above board in our industry is absolutely paramount. Prize money and, you know, the, the amount of prize money that's available, uh, I think, you know, we have to make prize money attractive. I think we have to have prize money in place that if, if, if an owner or syndicate have, have a greyhound that, you know, if he wins a race or two, that they have the prospect of breaking even with training fees in, in a calendar year. And, um, you know, we have to make it attractive and, you know, a percentage of that you know, prize money has to be available for trainers as well. Because I suppose the day of private trainers has definitely dwindled and, you know, um, you know, um, the chairman in his open statement said, you know, it is an industry that's, you know, associated with the farming community, and that's correct. But more and more, with the time pressure that's 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 on that's on farmers, and I suppose, uh, you know, with, with, with the change, with different changes in in, in society, uh, you know, um, the, the the availability of labour on farms has greatly reduced. So, you know, the training of dogs has definitely become more professional, more professional, um, um, uh, more professional operation. And it's absolutely essential that you know that this that this is that this is made an economically viable profession. And I think through prize money, increased prize money, and you know, giving the trainers a share of that, I think is the way to go. But for owners and syndicates, it can't be just seen that this is, you know, that, that, that there is an opportunity at least at least to break even if you have a, a reasonable success on the track. You know, attendances and tracking, attract, attracting people back through the turnstiles. Um, you know, I often take a walk out to Shelburne here on, on, on an evening, especially during the summer months. And you know, summer meetings here, even in the middle of the capital, are extremely poorly attended. And you know, we have to try and get people back in through back in through the turnstiles. 
and again, it's something, Chairman, I think, has to, I, know, I know it will be, uh, that you will be given paramount attention to. But I think we need more imagination as regards the bets that's available on the tort. And, you know, there was a while there, you know, a couple of years ago, where the jackpot on a Saturday night in Shelburne Park created great betting interest across the country on the tort. That has evaporated. And we need something like that that will attract punters in to, to invest in Saturday night after Saturday night. At, I think you have to have a big pot in place that will attract the punter and get the tort, get the tort um, um, punter back in, back in, back in through. The, you know that the tort will be an attractive proposition for, for, for attendees at the tracks. At the moment, you know, I see it. You know, people aren't betting into the tort in rural tracks in Dublin. It's just not happening. It, it has it has lost. It, uh, it's just not catch the, the pools that are there or the bits that are there aren't catching the public imagination, and definitely, you know, that that's absolutely essential that that, that we do that we do that. I'd also be worried about on-track bookmakers, and um, you know, I, I would I suppose some would say I need to have a bee in my bonnet about on-track bookmakers. The numbers have diminished very very significantly there over the last couple of years. And um, you know, I would say they're down 60, 70, 80 percent. If we go back over a 10-year period, the numbers have dropped. And I think you know the the, um, the, the proposition that was in the budget, um, you know, increasing the the, the basing tax from one to two percent, and um, to something I've raised at, at the Fianna Fáil parliamentary party. I would hope that for track bookmakers in the finance bill that we might be able to get an exemption to that, because that's a betting tax on turnover, and I just don't think track bookmakers will be will be will be able to um, will be able to cover that, and I think we could see the complete extinguishing of, of track bookmakers, and you know they bring an atmosphere to it, whether it is race tracks, whether it is horse racing or dog racing, they bring an atmosphere that is unique to the whole to the whole scheme, and uh, you know I think. To something that w would be a huge loss, and I know, you know, turnover on um, betting, turnover on the bookmakers has dropped very, very significantly. But I think, you know, if we allowed our demise, I think we, we will live to regret it. So, Chairman, you're coming in at a, a challenging time for the industry. Um, you know, the sales of Harold's Cross created an awful lot of debate. As I said, your previous chairman um, um, suffered suffered a lot during the during the period of time. In my view, it was the correct decision. You have, you know, we have, you have taken away the debt that was hanging over, over like a guillotine over the board. But I think this opportunity won't come again. There won't be another asset to sell like Carl's Cross, and we have to ensure that we drive forward from here, and that the funds that were left over obviously are used as wisely as possible. But I think, you know, we need to re we need to regenerate the industry, and I think your term of office, I think, is going to be a, is going to be a telling factor of whether this industry survives or not. And um, definitely, you know, it is under extreme pressure, and to attract young people back to the industry, I think, is you know, is is where we have to go. And I would definitely see that the amount of young people attending dog racing ha has dropped very, very significantly. So, Chairman uh, and Frank, I think you have a lot of challenges there. And um, I know you're, you're extremely well qualified for the position, but um, it's a challenging role you're taking on. I wish you the best to look. As I said, I'm involved in the industry myself, and um, I obviously like to see it, like, like to see it doing well. But I think that we have an awful lot of challenges out there that we can't ignore. And um, it's, it's. I'm not saying we can't get it back. We can't get industry back. But I think we need imagination and a, a lot of initiatives to try and do it. And I'm wishing you well in your tenure. Thanks very much, Deputy, Deputy Pringle. Uh, yeah, thank, thanks, Chairman, and uh, I'd like to thank Mr. Nayan for his uh, presentation. Um, I'm in the usual position of having a clue about Doug Grayson, and uh, wouldn't be anywhere too close to track. Well, Lefford would be the only, the only one in Donegal, but this is, I think, it's and bother at the moment. But I just wonder. This might seem a stupid question, or that, I don't know, but I mean. You talked there about the, the crisis being uh, and the uh, level of, of tax rate meetings and stuff like that there, but in the annual report for 2014, 15, 16 and 17, it actually is very consistent in terms of attendances and the number of uh, race meetings or the attendances per meeting. You know, it goes from a total of 644,000 in 2014 to 636,000 in 2016 people attending. Um, now, 17 is a wee bit different because the, 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 the figures include the dispute there. But, I mean, 
from my point of view, and I'm just talking from not knowing anything about it, but I mean that's worked out at about 60, between 1,600 and 1,700 meetings a year. I mean that seems to me a huge amount of meetings. Maybe the idea of maybe with less meetings of better quality maybe, might be more amenable to it. Like I mean that's it works out at like 32 meetings per week, which seems to me huge for uh, an industry. Now maybe I'm wrong. Maybe there's a perfect reason for that. So I just wondered about that. And I just say I just I suppose a bit flippantly. I think your term is five years, and you want to see the hope. You hope to see the Greyhound Bill implemented in the term over the lifetime of your term. You may be a bit optimistic, but uh, that's all, Chairman. Thanks. Thanks very much, Deputy. Um, the, the number of meetings are remaining consistent, but the number of dogs running um, are reducing, the number of races per night are reducing, and the number of people, while it, it is static over a three-year period, that's not a sufficient number to sustain the industry. Uh, we, we do actually need, the model requires a lot more people attending, because the, the only place we can get more money, essentially, for prize money, which is what funds the industry, is from people attending and from people sponsoring races. So we actually need to increase those so that we can feed money back in. I mean, the idea is that a person who owns a greyhound or two greyhounds is able to, is, is able to run them without it costing him money ultimately. And uh, that's probably not the position at the moment. Yeah. And, and uh, I, I would expect, Deputy, that, that we should be able to introduce a piece of legislation over five years. Uh, <laughs> so would I, but... Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Time will tell. Um, well, just, you know, I, you know I, the points I made to you there, um, uh, Mr. Nine, about you know, the regulation and the... You know, are you confident... Are you, have, are you happy with the, with the, with the Greyhound bill at the moment? Yeah, yes, uh, we've, we've, we've had a, an input, obviously, in, in, into the, 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 the legislation, and we've been before you in relation to the legislation, mm -hmm. and a lot of what we've asked for in relation to regulation is in the, is in the bill um, to strengthen, essentially, the hands of our hand and the hands of the various committees that will ultimately adjudicate uh, in, in enforcing regulation. I should say that... Um, you're absolutely correct when you say that we have a reputation, an unfortunate reputation, um, but really that's a perception problem rather than an actual problem. I mean, the, the rate of adverse analytical finding uh, is 0.45 per cent out of approximately 5,000 tests. And over the last three years, it has been 0.8 per cent, 0.5 something per cent, and 0.45 per cent. I mean, it's a minuscule amount over an awful lot of testing. But I accept fully what you say, we have a perception problem in relation to it. You, you might be aware that, that because you, you, you asked about our procedures, our procedures were recently tested before the High Court uh, in, in an application, and fortunately, they were held to be correct. And we'd hope that that would continue. We've invested a lot of money in regulation. I think we spent two million on, on, on various aspects of regulation um, in 2017. And uh, we have to continue to do that. It, it, it's, it's, if, we don't, if we don't crack that problem, um, we won't be able to do all the other things we need to do. And as regards progress with a giant lab with the horse racing island, has that been advanced or do you feel that that's the way to go? Yeah, we're in, we're in favour of that concept if it can be done. I know our chief executive and the chief executive of HRI have discussed that matter and uh, I think the next step will be some form of a subcommittee to prepare a, a report as to the feasibility of it. Um, there are challenges because uh, I'm not an expert in, in, in the field, but apparently there are physiological differences between dogs and horses um, that will require a um, dual testing system. But, I mean, it does make perfect sense that an Irish-based sports lab dealing with animals is a very good idea. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Mr. Nyan. Okay. To be you okay? Yeah. Okay. okay. Thanks very much. Thank you very much. I wish you the best of luck in your appointment. Thank you. Suspend. We'll suspend the meeting now until I think the minister is due at six at six p.m. Yeah. So we're at six anyway. <laughs>
Members are reminded of long-standing parliamentary practice to the effect that members should not comment on, criticise or make charges against either a person outside the House or an official, either by name or in such a way as to make him or her identifiable. Minister, could I now invite you to make your open statement, please? Uh, thank you, Mr Chairman. Um, I'd like to thank the members of the committee for the invitation to meet with them today to discuss aquaculture licensing in the context of the report of the Independent Aquaculture Licensing Review Group. The committee is familiar with the background to this issue, but it is useful to restate the position for the avoidance of confusion. This opening statement is therefore intended to provide the committee members with a broad overview of the aquaculture licensing system and how it operates. The key issues associated with the licensing backlog which gave rise to the review, a brief overview of the key recommendations of the review and progress to date on implementation. I'd be glad to take any questions from the committee members afterwards. An aquaculture license is required by law for the cultivation of finfish, shellfish and certain marine plants such as seaweed. Some aquaculture takes place on land but the vast majority of aquaculture ac activity takes place in the mar marine environment on the foreshore. In, our, in Ireland, almost all foreshore is in public ownership and aquaculture activity therefore requires both an aquaculture license to conduct operations and a companion foreshore license to lawfully occupy the area of foreshore in question. Even in the rare case of private foreshore, an aquaculture license is required to engage in aquaculture activity. The foreshore is measured from the high water mark out to 12 nautical miles and is approximately 39,000 square kilometres in overall size. It is roughly equal in size to just over 50% of the land area of the state. However, the areas suitable for aquaculture represent a small fraction of the foreshore and, in the case of finfish cultivation, are exclusively on the western seaboard. My department considers all applications for aquaculture licences in accordance with the following legislation. The Fisheries Amendment Act 1997, the Foreshore Act 1933, the EU Habitats Directive 9243, uh, the EU Birds Directive 79409, the Consolidated Environmental Impact Assessment Directives 2011 of 92 and the Public Participation Directive, otherwise known as the Aris Convention. The licensing process involves consultation with a wide range of scientific and technical advisors as well as various statutory consultees. The legislation also provides for a period of public consultation. In addition to the above, legislation by the Department must adhere to a wide range of regulatory requirements and other legislation which impact on the licensing process. The Public Participation Directive has emerged as a crucial factor in the rollout of the licensing system as it applies to individual cases. The key aim of this directive is to grant the general public specific rights regarding access to information in governmental decision-making processes on matters concerning the local, national and transboundary environment. The major complaint from aquaculture farmers on licensing relates to the backlog that has developed in the processing of license applications. The background to the backlog is that in 2007 the European Court of Justice issued a negative judgment against Ireland for breaches of the European Birds and Habitats Directive. A large element of the judgment concerned a failure by the state to put in place a system for data collection, definition of scientific interests and adequate assessment of aquaculture license applications in the Tura 2000 areas. At the time of the European Court of Justice case, national legislation was put in place to ensure that Irish aquaculture operations operating under pre-existing licences and who were seeking renewals could continue to operate under those licences until a determination could be made on their renewal applications in compliance with the Natura 2000 directives. In the negotiations to address this European Court of Judgment, judgment and to enable aquaculture to continue in Natura 2000 areas in the interim, a process was agreed with DG Environment and this is being implemented. The process includes data collection, the setting of conservation objectives by the National Parks and Wildlife Service, identifying the scientific interests to be protected in the bays, carrying out of appropriate assessments of the license applications against those scientific interests and appropriate licensing taking account of, among other things, Natura 2000 requirements. The production of these appropriate assessments has been resource intensive and very time consuming, not least because of tidal cycles and seasonality issues in relation to data gathering on bird migrations and other environmental phenomena. In many cases, multi-year 
time series data had to be collected. In addition to the seabeds in Natura 2000 areas also had to be mapped to identify conservation interests. For example, this work involved 123 survey events carried out by 10 contractors. In addition, profiling of agriculture industry activities was carried out, carried out for all bays in order to define the likely interactions between conservation features of sites. In many instances, there were little data or published literature on likely interactions between agriculture activities and conservation features. A number of targeted studies and reviews were commissioned to investigate responses of conservation features, example birds and or habitats, to specific agriculture and fisheries activities. Many of these have subsequently been published in primary literature. All of this preliminary work to prepare the groundwork for consideration of licensing went on from 2009 onwards. I'm glad to report that most of this data collection, definition of scientific interest and the appropriate assessments process itself is almost complete and appropriate assessment reports have been received by my department from the Marine Institute, Marine Institute in respect of 29 bays. These bays constitute the bulk of the aquaculture activity and the work carried out since 2009 permitted, permitted licensing in compliance with the Natura 2000 directives and the European Court of, Judge, European Court of Justice judgment to commence. Since licensing commenced under the new system, a little over 600 licensing, licensing decisions were made on aquaculture sites around the coast up to the end of 2017. Dealing with the Natura 2000 elements has been the factor that has been the major focus for all involved in the licensing process up to recently. But there are other issues, including legislative reform, the streamlining of procedures, and the optimum use of technology associated with licensing, which also need to be addressed. Because of all these elements, I commissioned the independent review of aquaculture licensing in December 2016, and the report was delivered to me at the end of May 2017. The review group carried out a detailed examination of the existing agricultural licensing process, undertook comprehensive stakeholder consultation, and looked at comparative national and international consent systems to determine best practice for mapping a complex licensing process in a transparent, environmentally appropriate, and legally robust manner. The group's report is published and available to view on my department's website. A total of 30 separate recommendations are contained in the report. Since re receiving the report of the review group, my department has engaged in detailed consideration of the recommendations set out in the report with a view to their implementation, having regard to the legislative, environmental, technical and public interest issues that arise. My department has also engaged closely with industry representatives and relevant state agencies. The core recommendation of the independent review was to deal with the backlog by the end of 2019. In response to the priority given by stakeholders to the elimination of the licensing backlog, my department has been actively working towards the achievement of 300 license determinations this year with a further 300 projected for 2019. I can confirm that the target of 300 license determinations has been achieved two months ahead of schedule. This is a very substantial achievement and gives a clear indication of my commitment and the commitment of my department to dealing with this issue in a comprehensive manner. I can further confirm that we are fully committed to achieving 300 further license determinations in 2019 and that this will effectively eliminate the shellfish licensing backlog as an issue affecting the industry. The elimination of the shellfish licensing backlog will be a game changer for the industry and will provide a solid footing for the industry long demanded by industry representatives. The bar chart which I've uh, circulated, uh, Chairman, uh, with, with the script, with the script um, sets out clearly the dimensions of the change that has been brought about in 2018 and is projected for 2019. Effectively, the rate of determinations of aquaculture license applications this year is almost three times the level of decisions that were made in previous years. Shellfish aquaculture represents by far the greatest number of operators who are also in the main small family run businesses. For this reason, and in conjunction with industry representatives, my department has prioritised the elimination reduction of the backlog in respect of shellfish aquaculture during 2018. For 2019, it is expected that the backlog in shellfish aquaculture will be effectively eliminated. Once shellfish farmers operating within Natura areas have been relicensed in, com re in compliance with the Natura directives, they can access development funding under our seafood development programme. 
In relation to finfish aquaculture, a focused modular approach towards addressing the backlog in finfish licensing will be accelerated. The processing of applications for finfish licenses in the marine environment is significantly more complex than the situation in relation to shellfish aquaculture due to the requirements of due to the requirement for operators to produce environmental impact statements and for my department and relevant agencies to analyse these reports in detail. My department must then produce an environmental impact assessment in relation to each application. In addition, developments that apply generally to aquaculture licensing have a particular resonance for finfish licensing for the following reasons. A greater focus by environmental NGOs and the general public on key European Union legislation and heightened public awareness and concerns about aquaculture operations mainly relating to salmon farming, but concerns also arise frequently in relation to shellfish licensing. There should be no doubt in anybody's mind that the core reason I established the Independent Aquaculture Licensing Review Group was the need to address the licensing backlog arising from the European Court of Justice judgment. This was the primary concern of industry stakeholders. This core need is being actively and urgently addressed by my department and the first results of our efforts are already discernible. We have achieved 300 license determinations this year to date. We will, I am confident, achieve a further 300 licence determinations next year. The related recommendations are also being addressed and will be implemented as part of a larger reform of the regulatory process. However, I have been very conscious of the need to prioritise implementation in response to what the industry has itself pointed to as the most urgent issue, the licensing backlog. Once this has been eliminated for the bulk of operators who are in the shellfish sector, they will be operating under 10-year licences and can access developmental funding and supports available from the state. In relation to finfish licensing, my department is scheduled to formally request operators to submit environmental impact statements in respect of their licence renewal applications. This request is scheduled to issue to all operators shortly and will specify the timeline for submission of the necessary documentation. This process was commenced by my department in 2014, but following strong representation from IFA Agriculture on behalf of the aquaculture industry, the matter was not advanced until additional guidelines and workshops on the issue were provided by BIM. Chairman, if I, if I might just uh, t take the opportunity in the context of reference to the IFA uh, to pay tribute uh, to uh, the IFA Agriculture uh, representative, uh, Richie, uh, Richie Flynn, Richie Flynn uh, who uh, sadly passed away recently. Um, he had given, um, I, I think, many, many years of sterling service uh, to the aquaculture sector, and um, his unfortunate, uh, untimely passing, uh, I think, is a great loss uh, to the aquaculture sector and indeed to everybody in IFA as well. But um, I had the, the great privilege of working very closely with him uh, over many years, both in this uh, capacity, but also as an opposition spokesperson, and he was always uh, the most courteous of gentlemen to, to meet with, but had a, a steely determination in, in respect of the sector that he represented, and it would be remiss of me not to avail of the opportunity to, to acknowledge uh, his role and his passing uh, at, at this opportune time. Thank you, uh, Chairman. Uh, my department indicated that it, it would suspend uh, its request uh, in respect of uh, this process until those workshops, etc., were complete. However, this was without prejudice to any operator in the fish industry who wished to submit a valid environmental uh, uh, impact statement in the interim. The process will now be renewed with requests for environmental impact statements uh, before the end of the year. This represents a significant response to the recommendation of the Independent Aquaculture Licensing Revu Review Group in the context of finfish aquaculture. The provision of valid environmental impact statements in compliance with the guidelines prepared by BIM and given to applicants will enable my department to advance these applications in line with the European Union legal requirements. An efficient and effective licensing system can be an important tool in the strategic direction of the aquaculture industry and can set the weather in terms of aquaculture development. As indicated above, my department has delivered 300 aquaculture license determinations this year, a trebling of the, of the previous rate of determinations, and a commitment to deliver a further 300 next year with a view to clearing the backlog which built up due to the European Court of Justice judgment. 
In addition, my department is currently engaged in forward planning in conjunction with industry representatives and relevant agencies directly focused on the rapid reduction and elimination of the finfish licensing backlog. A key part of this planning process is ensuring that the industry can continue to operate as normal in accordance with legislative requirements. The legislative provisions that were put in place to enable operators to continue working pending completion of the licensing process in line with the EU natural requirements have enabled all operators to continue their business. This still applies. It is important to note that while attention has been given to difficulties associated with licensing, this is in fact a buoyant industry with a good record of employment. The 2018 BIM annual aquaculture survey indicates that Irish aquaculture output in 2017 increased to 47,147 tonnes of farm gate produce worth 208 million, 208.4 million. Production continued to expand in both overall volume, which was up 7%, and value, which was up 24%, and unit value from 2016. The salmon sector was the major contributor to the increase in both overall volume and value, while oyster sector output continued to expand. The unit value of both these sectors continues to increase, as does the recognition of their product quality. The bottom mussel sector continued to recover in 2017, though seed supply uncertainty remains a threat to this. The overall industry employed almost 2,000 people directly on, on about 280 primary production units in 2017. My department has also put in place substantial financial and other support for the industry as a whole. Financial support is supplied under the EMFF operational programme and is directed towards three main areas, sustainable aquaculture production, knowledge innovation and new technology, and more effective governance of marine planning. In addition to the direct financial supports, BIM provides a range of technical supports to the agricultural sector to assist in the development of existing businesses and to address industry-wide issues such as disease management and the introduction of new technologies. To conclude, the steps with, that have been taken by myself and my department to establish the independent review and take forward the core recommendations on eliminating the backlog are bearing fruit, and I believe we are well on the way to eliminating this historic issue and putting the industry on a sound footing going forward. My department will be glad to update the Committee on Progress and Agriculture Licensing as and when required. Thank you very much, Chairman. Thank you, sir. Um, Deputy McCullough. Thank you, Chairperson, and uh, thank you to the Minister and to your officials for coming in today and for um, your opening presentation and overview uh, of, the, of the issue, Minister. I suppose we had a, a very thorough session a number of months ago with your officials in relation to the actual um, the, the, the Agriculture Licensing Review Report um, and went through it in some detail and uh, they did outline to us a lot of what you have outlined to us here today in relation to what has come to pass, um, the background to it and also the fact that there is a prioritisation being made in relation to dealing with the backlog in relation to shellfish um, applications and indeed the 300 uh, license uh, target this year and next year. Um, we did, however, and, uh, during that session, um, press them very significantly in relation to the uh, implementation of all of the, re the, the recommendations from the Aquaculture Licensing Review Report. Um, and uh, very much the feedback we were getting in that session was that the prioritisation at this point in time was on the shellfish backlog um, and that the, rec the other recommendations would have to await the progress being made in that and be dealt with subsequently down the line. Um, and as you pointed out yourself, there are, there are 30 separate, uh, I think it's 30 separate uh, recommendations from the report. And the very final, um, after the, 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 those 30 recommendations are outlined, the uh, review committee um, go on to indicate, and I'll just quote because I think it's useful to, 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 um, to outline where they were coming from. They indicated in what they said in their summing up that the group undertook its review work in line with the terms of reference and acknowledges that implementation of the report is a matter for the Minister and the Department. Implementation of all of the recommendations in this report will be challenging. However, the group considers that it would be beneficial to set out an implementation strategy which would assign responsibility for recommendations, accountability and set milestones for delivery and identify the necessary resources to support the implementation process. Now, that sort of summarises where they're at 
and what they felt needed to happen with regard to the 30 various recommendations which they had put forward. And a couple of the first two recommendations they had actually put forward and commenced with was uh, outlining the need for a reasonable time scale for licence determinations, um, and that uh, that there needed to be that that needed to be put in place. And indeed, as part of that as well, Minister, they outlined that there needed to be legislation, that there should be legislation developed in order to uh, to, to to put in place a new licensing system. Now, when we had discussed this with the officials the last day, um, we were informed that there hadn't been really any progress in relation to that legislation, and that that legislation would have to, would have to take a back seat as such uh, to the uh, prioritisation of resources towards the shellfish licensing backlog. So while I would acknowledge the important work of dealing with the shellfish backlog, um, I don't see any reason why, Minister, we don't um, almost not far off a year and a half on from the publication of the licensing review that we don't have an implementation strategy yet and that we haven't had something published from you as the Minister dealing with the various recommendations, outlining who responsibility was assigned uh, for, for implementing each of those recommendations and putting um, a timeline, an implementation uh, uh, timeline in place for each of them. Um, that would be, at its minimum, Minister, I would have thought, a basic response to the report um, and a basic outline of how we, uh, we would actually progress. Um, and I simply think it's not acceptable that you, as Minister, haven't yet produced that and ensured that your officials have, have produced that. And that's why, um, having discussed it here at Oireachtas Committee, we decided that it was important that yourself, as, the, as, the, as the, the political head of the department, that it was important that we actually engaged further with you, teased out these issues, and particularly put the point across to you in relation to actually getting that implementation uh, plan in place, and then also, Minister, looking to back it up with the necessary resources to make progress. Can I also um, touch, um, Minister, on the issue of the finfish um, licensing um, backlog? Um, certainly the prioritisation has been on, on the, the shellfish licences, but there, has, there is a very significant backlog which hasn't been addressed yet in relation to finfish, um, and we have to bear in mind that finfish uh, make up 75% of the value of the aquaculture market overall, but being, being, being the most significant uh, part of it value-wise. Um, you'll be aware of a company in my own part of the world, and indeed it, it's it, 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 a Marine Harvest, which also, uh, which I think is the most, by far, the, the largest salmon producer in the in the country, but minister, and also uh, works uh, down as far as Cork along the west coast with its processing base in Fanad, um, and that processing base that it has operates at some, somewhere around 40% capacity, with uh, a lot more capacity to actually uh, process uh, fish where they are available, um, and also the uh, resultant employment that that could create. And I know in North Donegal, it's in an area where other types of employment is few and far between. Um, and. Uh, Unfortunately, and if you look at the, uh, from uh, had a meeting with them recently and looked at the, the list of licences that they have had on um, on file, Minister, in terms of a waiting decision, and if you go back through the data, the date of renewal application, um, Minister, it's anything from 2005, 2007, 2007, 2015, 2014, uh, number four or five more, 2005, three or four, seven or eight actually, uh, back to 2011. Um, and two at 2006. Um, and they have three live new applications in place. Um, one of them commenced uh, for the shot head and Bantry back in 2011, another submitted for Waterfall in 2016, and one submitted for Doan Moore or for the Swilly um, in uh, 2014. And they're sitting there, Minister, not being able to be progressed. Um, th that particular company has indicated that they are in a position to invest up to 22 million euro um, uh, in the event of uh, licences being able to be progressed uh, and through the system, which could add another 250 jobs, uh, many of them in North Donegal, but also right across the west coast, including in your own county. So that's an example in relation to the finfish sector, where the fact that we are not on top of processing the applications and we don't have the resources in place to, or, or the, the, uh, a streamlined licensing system in place to actually move them on, where we are not 
utilising and maximising the value and potential of our aquaculture industry, um, and particularly with regard to fin fishing. If you look, going back to 2003, salmon production was at uh, 23,000, whereas um, uh, last year I think it was just under 19,500 um, tonnes. Um, while if you look at it comparatively to other countries, particularly Scotland, we see a scenario where licences from submission to, to conclusion and to decision can be done within a couple of years and indeed um, uh, as a result of that we see that sector growing and in particular in the last number of years we've seen uh, marine harvest pioneer the organic um, salmon um, production um, and that, that has uh, meeting a very a very strong need in the market where, uh, where demand is increasing but because of the backlog uh, and delay in terms of putting, uh, processing uh, licenses that um, demand is, is, is not being able to be met or indeed expanded upon. Um, so I, I would ask you Minister on those points I raised specifically the, the implementation plan, the legislation and also specifically on the, the fin fish and the backlogs we're experiencing there um, and the need for a radical uh, overhaul of it and a new system to be put in place to, to address those in, in re responding. Thank you. Thank you, Chairman. Um, yeah, I'd like to thank the Minister for his uh, update on the licence and review procedure. Um, I have a number of questions just in relation to the whole process. And, um, I mean, obviously, I understand why it's, it's taken such time to, to, do, to carry it out and that there, and that there has been a backlog because of the requirement of testing and that that had to be done. But I understood that this, and it was, I think it was your previous predecessor as Minister, I said that this was a, a preparation for the rollout of an EU-wide uh, system of licensing on this island was being used as kind of the testing model for, for that, for an EU-wide uh, body. So I wonder, would you just uh, explain, expand on that maybe for the committee as well, just in relation to that, because I think it might have some <coughs> implications for... Scotland and other countries as well as to what uh, is actually can happen there or is this simply an Irish system and it has been implemented by forced on us by the EU uh, as an Irish system and that we have to go along with a, a lot more rigorous uh, licensing regime in relation to that. Um, just in relation to the, I mean, the, the applications that have been granted, the, the figures that you have, the 300 a year or whatever that's been granted, they have, they, they, they've been in for an, an awful long time because of the testing regime and stuff like that there. And there has been a big problem with the public in terms of, I mean, a, a bay gets approval, it gets all uh, approvals, and all of a sudden then this, uh, the number of licensing applications, some of them have been in for a number of years and have sat there and nothing happened with them. And all of a sudden then the public are getting informed that these licenses are taking place and they're wondering where they came from, what's happening. And I think the public has been left out as part of a, a stakeholder in relation to this process. And I think that could lead us uh, leading to an awful lot of um, conflict and an awful lot, a lot of difficulty. Um, and I think whatever licensing regime you put in has to be able to uh, facilitate the public, allow the public to have their role in play and, and participating with it. And I'm just wondering, is your own department the right body to be issuing the licenses um, on that basis? Because, I mean, you're very integral in terms of uh, funding for uh, aquaculture and everything else as well, so, and you're also licensing. And I just see from the overall response that you've given here that the public really don't get a mention or get a look in, and I think that's regrettable because I think an awful lot of the issues that can be dealt with would be by involving the public as well, and I think we, we you should be looking at the public as being uh, a stakeholder as well and being required to be... Um, contacted and talked to, talk to as well. Um, and also just in relation to the, the updating of the information, there's been a huge amount of information gathered over the last number of years of all the different bays and stuff like that there, and, that's, and I think that's very important information. Um, but that information then won't be static forever, so it has to be updated. So have you put in place systems to uh, update for updating of that information as well? So is that for future, like when these renewal applications come into place? Um, 
when these re renewal applications come up in 2010 or whatever, 10 year licenses, they're gonna, that information is going to have to be new and fresh again. So, are we going to end up in the whole same situation again? And when the new licenses come to be reviewed again, I, I think that's going to be important. So, that there's going to have to be a system of constantly updating this information. And so, I just wonder if you could expand a wee bit on that as well. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Minister, our, our uh, the, the, the Agriculture Committee here uh, had asked um, your department to submit an up, uh, updated report dealing uh, with the 30 recommendations, and what we received was uh, the summary document with no details, recommendation by recommendation update. That's what we asked for, um, and what we have here is a, 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 a sort of a it's not good enough anyway. What you've given us today, similarly, I mean, I, I just want to apologise for a bit late for your, your, your presentation, but if you look at uh, progress to date on implementation, and there's three paragraphs there, and all it says is you're dealing with the 300 uh, backlog in shellfish over the next two years. That's not what we asked for. We asked for the 30 recommendations for you specifically and your officials to tell us what you're doing to implement the recommendations, or if you're refusing to implement them, tell us. But if you, we, we assume that you're going to implement all 30 recommendations, and I think that our, the houses they rocked us to serve to know on a recommendation by recommendation basis where you're at with the implementation. Now, that's not what we have here today. It's not acceptable, Minister. You know, I, I think it's offensive to this committee, frankly, that we have had this really poor uh, uh, report, and now we have this today, which is three paragraphs dealing with 30 recommendations. It's not acceptable. So that's the first thing to say. The second thing is the reason why this committee, the Agriculture Committee, uh, Agriculture, Food and the Marine, the reason why this committee is so exercised uh, is because of the stunning failure of this state to develop the uh, salmon uh, farming industry. Stunning failure. Today, Norway, a European country, uh, in 2018 uh, is producing 1,278,000 100 tonnes, 1,278,100 tonnes, Scotland 174,000 tonnes, the Faroe Islands, which is five times the size of Ackill Island, the Faroe Islands 73,000 tonnes, our, our states 17,000 tonnes, 17,000 tonnes, it was 23,500 tonnes 17 years ago. It's outrageous, absolutely outrageous how a department can strangle the potential of an industry that can create hundreds and hundreds of jobs in rural coastal communities. Outrageous what has happened here. And we had this independent report with 30 recommendations and we have no update either from your department officials or today as to what's happening to deal with this crisis, this profound failure to develop the, the potential of this industry. Sixteen years ago, I visited Marine Harvest, which is a, an important employer in rural North Donegal for the first time, sixteen years ago, and I could see the potential of that industry, and today that industry's potential has been strangled. It's absolutely shocking. Sixteen years, almost my entire uh, public service, uh, I've been a public representative all of those years, and it's just going backwards. That's the urgency of the issue. Just to say to you too that the salmon farming uh, industry is 75% of aquaculture. 75% of aquaculture. Yet you focus on shellfish. That's called low hanging fruit. So you go for 300 licenses this year, 300 licenses next year in the shellfish area. Okay. You, you, the, the reality also is that the uh, Aquaculture Licensing Appeal Board is not resourced adequately. So you're going to have all of these low-hanging fruit uh, applications in shellfish, which is 25% of the overall industry. And you're going to backlog the Aquaculture uh, Appeals Licensing uh, uh, process without resourcing them adequately. Uh, that's the appeals process. 
So that's the, that's those those points. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm just I'm actually shocked, Minister. I, I I genuinely shocked at the lack of urgency in your department, considering the shocking failure to develop this industry of real importance to rural coastal communities. I mean, those statistics are irrefutable. Irrefutable. And then you ask why, and the answers are clear. Scotland, 18 to 22 months uh, to deal with applications, typically 18 to 22 months. There's one on the board here since 2005, 13 years. No, it's been strangled by bureaucracy and a failure to update systems. Absolutely strangled by bureaucracy. And you know, you're going to come back and you'll get the word in your ear now from your officials about the EU. That's 10 years ago. That's a long time ago. A long time to deal with these issues and resource and address them. So we get to the point where we have an independent report. And I commend you, Minister, on the independent report. I don't, I'm not having a go at you personally, but I think your department officials have seriously failed uh, our rural coastal communities. So we get to this independent report, and then we finally get it published. We get the, the hearings in this committee, and as I say, still we don't know what your department officials are doing in relation to the 30 recommendations, and we need to know very, very soon. So now my final questions are this. In terms of your department, can I find out who is responsible for making recommendations to you around issuing of licences? So who is the department official who makes recommendations to yourself around the issuing of licences? Right? And then who is the department official or officials who would deal with the enforcement of regulations? So I mean, what, I suppose the reason why I'm asking the question is it appears to me that you, you should have uh, a separation of department officials or states agency officials who are responsible for the development and the licensing of the industry and then you need to have somebody probably in the environmental sector who deals with the enforcement of regulations in the industry. You need to separate out those two matters and indeed that is pretty much one of the recommendations from the independent report. You know, that you, need, you need no conflicts of interest, that you need to make sure now, so be interested to know who are the department officials, are they different people, are they different individuals who deal with the recommendations on licensing and the, the enforcement of regulations, are they separate people, separate departments or are they one and the same? I'd just like to get an understanding of that because that appears to me to be a challenge um, and I may have more follow up questions, thank you. Yes, Thank you very much, uh, Chairman, and I'd like to thank the, the, the three members, and I think it's probably the, no accident that the, the, the three are from Donegal, and I, I do appreciate their, their long-standing interest in, in this issue. Um, uh, Senator McLaughlin made reference to, to one company, uh, as I think did the two previous speakers. Um, I, in fact, no, visited that facility you know, a number of years ago, uh, myself, long before I was in this position. And I very much appreciate the potential and, and, uh, that's in the sector. Um, it's a relatively new industry here, and in the context of, of farming generally, uh, it's certainly uh, a new industry <coughs> globally. And we are, relative to global development on it, very much in, our, in its nascent stage here in, in, in Ireland. And I make absolutely, uh, colleagues, no apology whatsoever um, in the context of the report that you allude to for taking and running with the most critical element of it, ahead and beyond by a country mile of any other of the recommendations, and that is clearing the licence backlog. I make no apology whatsoever for that, because that's the key to unleashing the potential. All of the rest, to me, are secondary considerations. And uh, in, in an ideal world, we'd have flow charts and we'd have uh, you know, indications, but I asked the division within the department, specifically asked, and, and, and the commitment is there, that as a first step in the context of, of, of that report, that we would prioritise, to the cost of every other recommendation, if necessary, uh, the clearing of the, the licensing backlog. And that's what we'll do. And we are making progress in that regard, and I make no apology for that. That is the key critical issue because you can't work without a licence. And, um, I, uh, Senator, um, I mean, I can't operate in that context outside of the law, and it is important to take into account the European Court of Justice judgment. Uh, but in the context of uh, that judgment, I think to, to give credit to officials whom I think you unfairly malign, 
uh, they did negotiate in the context of a very clear judgment against us and finding against us in the context of our licensing arrangements in, uh, in the context of the uh, Habitats Directive. Um, they did negotiate a permission for those who ha currently had licenses to continue to operate under those licenses whilst we did a, quite an enormous undertaking in terms of gathering all of the data for the appropriate assessments in all of the bays. We were literally starting from scratch, from scratch and that was quite a mammoth undertaking uh, to, to do that. But in order that we didn't, uh, which would have been a calamitous, uh, the judgment was challenging, but it would have been calamitous if the judgment was applied with, with its full rigour and intent, it would have closed down the industry. And what we negotiated was an ability for the industry to continue to operate its, its existing licences. Now, reference has been made uh, to the tonnage, um, and I, I make this point, I'm aware of the international comparisons, but we need to be, be, be uh, sure that we are comparing like with like. Our production is generally in the organic sphere, so it's not as intensive an operation, a production system as... Uh, you know, others in the international sphere that have been quoted. Um, but that having been said, it is lower than it was in, in, in the early noughties. Um, but I think, the, the, you know, the, the, the history of the sector will show that in the early noughties, uh, there was a collapse of the, the European market. Um, a lot of the, the early operators, by virtue of the economic consequences of that, got wiped out. Um, there was a court case, uh, an anti-dumping court case, taken at a European level, um, but the consequences for the, for the early operators in the industry here was they were wiped out. So we were virtually starting from scratch again uh, post-2003, which is the figure I think that Dep Deputy McConnell alluded to when it was at 23,000 tonnes. Um, and, and I think the, the, uh, the, the flexibility that the, the, albeit restricted arrangements uh, that we have arising from the European Court of Justice um, ruling show that, uh, in fact, since 2012, um, it was, it was 12,000 tonnes. In 2016, it was 16,300 tonnes. And in 2017, we produced 19,305 tonnes. So the trajectory has been in the right direction. Um, but we need, we need, to, we need to make uh, more progress uh, on finfish, which seems to be the... the um, the primary concern for the, the deputies, and I understand that. Uh, it's not 75% of the value. Um, in, in fact, I think the figures I have for, for 2016 is the value of the, the finfish side would have been around the 100 million, and the, the value of the shellfish was just shy of 60 million. So it's more in the region of two to one rather than 75. But that's a mute point. They are both extremely valuable sectors and provide very valuable employment, um, no matter where you know or, or which enterprise it is. And our endeavour is to get to a situation where the, the licensing re regime, you know, enables the full potential of the sector to be realised. But in taking into account the, the, you know, the licensing regime, we have to be conscious that in the context of that process, there are rights enjoyed by all parties, and I think Deputy McPringle alluded to this. You know, there are rights of third parties to register their views, um, and there is an independent appeals process in respect of um, any license determinations that are issued. Um, and that's as, as it is, you know, if you look at comparable issues the most obvious one is a planning application, a routine planning application to a local authority. There is, there is an appeals process to Board Canada. There is an appeals process in respect of uh, these licensing decisions, and that can be exercised by either a third party or an applicant. Yeah, but um, the, the council doesn't fund the, the development as well, like? No, but, it, but, the, the, but the, the, local the local authority is responsible for both the, uh, the granting of a planning permission and also responsible for enforcement. So it has both the development and enforcement. Yeah, but it doesn't actually it's provide funding for them as well. Like, you know, and that, and that's, the difference, that, that's a very important difference. Well, I, 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 I think it is appropriate that you know, uh, my department has a, a role and one that we take really seriously and negotiated substantial funding under the EMFF uh, to assist uh, approved and licenses operators to achieve their potential. I don't think that in any way is, 
you know, in conflict with our role to no, determine I'm not saying license. And I'm if not you saying talk to, I think it is in conflict with your role to determine licenses, but I think it's, it's exactly your role to, to get as much funding as possible for the industry. Yeah, but you should not also be licensing the operators. I mean, I think the licensing system needs to be independent of. The well, look, I mean, uh, I, I, I hear you, and we, we may not agree on this. I mean. Um, there are different views about that. Um, I, I do not see it as, as a conflict at all. Um, we, we, we take all of the respective roles extremely seriously. I mean, there are a lot of licensed applica applicants uh, who would wish, you know, that uh, it wasn't the case. I appreciate, but every successful license at issues, you know, is quite happy with the process. But there are appeals and there are checks and balances built into any system. Um, so, I mean, we are striving as, as, as an imperative to, to address the, the licensing backlog. Um, and that doesn't mean, mind you, that that is, is to find in favour of all applicants. It's not, because the, the, the statistics show, in fact, I think of the, the 300 licences that were granted this year, approximately 160 were positive and 140 were 160 grants and 144 refusals. So, I mean, it's not... It's not um, a slam dunk, you know, that we, we, you know, we, we don't, we are, are not compromised in, 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 in the integrity of the process one iota. And, and as I said, there are, there are checks and balances uh, in, in the system as well. Um, just uh, with, with, with regard to one of the points made, and I don't intend to, and I think it would be appropriate to reference any individual applications, but uh, Deputy McConnell did mention one shot head. That was one of the licenses that was granted uh, by the department. Um, the Finfish one is obviously the, you know, the one that's of, 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 of greater interest in, in, in Donegal, and I appreciate the, the range, of, uh, the geographical spread of the, the, the uh, industry. Um, and we are, in, in terms of uh, trying to, to accelerate that licensing process, we will be uh, you know, issuing a requirement for environmental impact statements. That is the necessary next step. Uh, to, to clearing the backlog in that area of, of license applications, but bear in mind that all the existing license holders continue to have that license and operate under it. Um, so it's, it's a complex uh, process. It's, it's not easy. I mean, I've referenced all of the, the, the legislation that governs it from habitats directives, boards directives, uh, foreshore legislation. It is extraordinarily complex to do the, all the appropriate assessments, take into account the individual nature of all the, the, the bays involved, the flora and fauna, the competing demands for access to, to the, um, the feed potential in the bays, etc. So it's, it's, it's a complex system. I think I've, I've dealt with... Um, um, but I, just I, I asked a question about the, 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 the conflict of interest or potential conflict of interest in terms of like who are the like in terms of just to be clear, we don't need to name names, but in terms of is it the same uh, officials that would make a recommendation to you around licensing as would make a recommendation in terms of enforcement and penalties? Are they the same department? The same? There, I mean, the the, the 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 unit operates out of the department headquarters in Clonakilty. Yeah. Um, it, it's not a. a a large unit, um, you know, there there is recommendation and input in, in terms of the development process from, from BIM, as, as I understand it. So it's the same people? No, no, the, the BIM is an independent agency in, in yeah. respect of the development of, of, of the... No, no, but my question is, uh, th th there will be officials, because obviously you sign off on a licence being uh, authorised, mm -hmm. and, and also there will be enforcement and penalties. Uh, are, are, is that the same people yes. that do that? Yes. Minister, that's a problem. That's a problem, Minister. But, uh, but that, that's the same uh, that operates in the department in, in the context of agriculture as well. Yeah, but, and, uh, but, yeah, but <laughs> what we've just brought to your attention is a, an industry that has been squeezed for the best part of, it, of two decades, uh, an industry that has not achieved its potential. Squeeze, and, uh, squeeze uh, Deputy, not by, by virtue of no, the no, point no, you no, raised. No, squeeze it, by it, virtue of the... The bind that was put on the industry and the department in the context of a European Court of Well, let's just deal with that. Let, let, and, and, and in the context of that bind, mm. the, you know, we are accelerating the process of licence uh, uh, determination, which is, is, is a critical... Let's part just deal with the ECJ, because you, you've referenced, uh, referenced the ECJ in two, 2007. It's 11 years ago. 11 years, mm -hmm. right? So uh, that, that, that arose from um, Habitat's directive not been transposed. That was 24 years ago. Uh, governments didn't do that. Nothing to do with the industry. So that's, that's, that's 11 years ago. 
11 years ago. The, the, the other point is, is that this only is a problem. Um, uh, you know, like for example, there are applications where SACs do not apply, and they are also facing the same delays. So, I, I mean, 11 years is a hell of a long time to get to grips with the implications of a, of a decision. Uh, and, I, and I see the Birds Directive you referred to in 2009. Like that's, that's a decade, a decade to get to grips when you see the impact it's having on an industry. We're desperately trying to get jobs into particularly rural coastal communities, desperately trying to get employers into those communities. And for a whole decade, I'm sorry, but the excuse of the ECJ is long run out, long run out, 11 years. You know, seriously, we, they shouldn't even be put here in front of us now at this stage as a barrier. But what I'm saying to you is that you now have, the, and this is, this, is, this is what makes me actually quite angry. As a, and you, you say a, a person from Donegal, well, it just happens that, you know, I'm, I'm a former member of this committee. The two colleagues are members of this committee. Uh, and, and the reason about the coastal, including your community, coastal communities right down the west coast of Ireland, from Donegal down to your own home county of Cork, uh, have been let down. Uh, and the potential of this. I mean, it's estimated that the loss here, because of all of this, is over a billion, will be over a billion within a year or two. A, a loss of over a billion in terms of production. That's what's estimated by the industry here. That's what we're talking about. How many jobs is that? Well, Hundreds of no, no, I, I'm, not, I'm going to finish now with, 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 with this point. Is that this independent report is published, and I commend you for that getting done. It was, uh, it was, apparently, it's a third report looking at changes in the system. The third, right? But this one is, is critical. It's got it's got 30 recommendations. I have not heard from you, Minister, or your officials once that you're not going to implement those recommendations. So I assume you're going to implement all 30. One of them clearly says you need to separate out the decision on licensing from uh, the other matters. You need to separate out uh, uh, you know, decision-making processes so they're independent of each other. So if somebody is responsible for development and licensing and all of that, that they can get on with that. And if somebody is responsible for, and, and that's important too, for making sure that licenses are adhered to, that the concerns of the public are listened to, that th these, are, these are matters that need to be separated out. That's one of the recommendations. Yet you're saying today, you don't see a conflict of interest. There's different views on that. So we need clarity. Are you going to implement all 30 recommendations? And are you going to listen to our concerns as representatives for not just Donegal, but for rural communities, particularly rural coastal communities, that there's a massive loss here and there's a lack of urgency? As I say, you say 65%, others say 75%. But the significant majority of value in this sector and the urgency is in, is in that area of finfish. Yet you guys, in this, in this summary that you gave us from your department, talked about it being kicked back to 2020. 2020, two years. Two thirds of it is in chaos. It's not, it's not happening. It's stalled. It's been squeezed. But we'll wait two more years. That's the lack of urgency and the lack of acceptance in, in your department. And I see nothing in your statement here today, Minister. And I'm just asking you to see, the purpose of this meeting today is it, it doesn't achieve anything me venting my frustration and anger and you listening patiently and you're, you know, in fairness to you, you're a calm, patient man. That doesn't achieve anything. But what I'm appealing to you today, Minister, is to understand and maybe, maybe even to start to meet with some of those stakeholders in the aquaculture industry who feel that they're being stymied, to go and meet them, go and visit their production centres, see the potential, you know, and, and, and then go back to your officials and demand change. You know, we need to see change. What has gone before has to end, has to end, and there has to be a change in attitude. But I think it's shocking that after everything that I've said, that we get a report to this committee that says it'll be two more years before we get round to Finfish, you know, before we prioritise it. We're prioritising the low-hanging fruit of the shellfish licences. So that's just... It's, something has to seriously change here if we're to achieve our potential, you know. Is it Thomas wants to ask a question. Deputy Springer, I will let you have a reply then, Deputy Springer. Yeah, just, just answer good. I had two questions earlier on there. In relation to the role of the EU and the EU Commission in terms of enforcing this licensing procedure on us, uh, if you'd expand on that a bit, and also then as well in relation to the updating of this information for future licenses when these 10 years are, are sorry, out. Sorry, Deputy, I was updated of the information for future licenses. So when. The ten-year license. You have a ten-year license now that you're going to have to reapply, and ten years time for your next license. But the information will be out of date. 
that the environmental information that you have got at this stage, I presume it will have to be updated. It is being, as we speak, it is being. That's what I want to check, yeah. yeah. Okay, Minister, thank you. Yeah, um, I mean, I, I, I'm something uh, um, at a loss to, to um, and I, I appreciate your, your commitment, Senator McLaughlin, but you talk about a loss of, of a billion euros to the, to the sector. All of, under the European Court of Justice ruling, we negotiated a situation where everybody who had a license could continue to operate under that license. And in, in the period from, from 2004 on the Finfish side to 2017, the tonnage has increased almost by 30 per cent, from 15,000 tonnes to nearly 20,000 tonnes, 15,200 to 19,500. So, in fact, in the, in, in, in the face of pretty severe constraints by the Court of Justice, uh, the industry has grown in volume terms. That's, that's uh, a, a fact that's not disputable. We're one tenth of Scotland, one tenth of the production of Scotland. I accept that, yeah, but, but the licensing regime in Scotland isn't, isn't exactly you know, a, a walk in the park either. I mean, there are seven, there are seven different licenses. It's involved. not 12 years, it's not 13 years. Yeah, but they are. Apologies, apologies. I mean, I, I, mean, I appreciate the points you make, and, and my, my ambition is, and I have engaged with the sector, is to get a system that's fit for purpose, that delivers on the potential, that recognises the rights. Of, of applicants and third parties, that the process is fair and transparent, um, and that, as I said, as an imperative, deals with the licence backlog. Because until we have done that and, and made determinations on, on all those applications, the first thing you need to grow the production um, uh, is to have a determination on licence applications. That's, that's, that's one of the critical gatekeepers. There are others. Um, I mean, I have mixed views on some of the recommendations. I have mixed views on some of the recommendations. I mean, I don't think you would find unanimity uh, within uh, the, the agriculture sector, for example, on 20-year licences. Um, know some might. Uh, I would suspect a majority of operators might not. The costs associated with that. Uh, third parties, NGOs might certainly not like the fact that we would be, uh, you know, giving away uh, rights for a, pro a, a generational period effectively, um, and there will be significant costs that might be beyond the scope of many uh, smaller enterprises, certainly. Um, so there are, I mean, the, 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 um, there, there are 30 recommendations, but I make no apology for, for prioritising in absolute terms uh, the dealing with the, the backlog of licences, and that's where we're at. Uh, Deputy Pringle raised an important point. I mean, are we going to get caught up again in the next wave because of, uh, no, we are, we are doing second round now of appropriate assessments uh, so that we, we continue to update the, the database and enable us uh, in, you know, to make uh, determinations more effectively. Uh, but the critical thing is to, is to build the... the um, that, 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 I mean, we started without any baseline on, on those bays and, and, and what was happening there in terms of uh, all of the criteria that were found against, we were found against on in, in terms of our court. So we, we, we did have a, a mammoth undertaking, um, and it's important that you know we don't see that as a, a finite obligation. It's, it's a re an revolving uh, obligation because bays change and, oh. and their biological capacity to sustain. Uh, Wildlife and, 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 and agriculture operations is, is defined at any particular time, so it's obviously important that we continue that, that process on a regular basis. So, so if you could address the issue around the EU as well, I mean, you, you said there that Scotland has their own licensing process and can be. We were told in this committee previously by the previous minister that this was the EU was using Ireland as a template to roll out across the EU. Um, if our system is so rigorous now that it takes a number of years longer than Scotland, how can that be? Like, 
you know, so either, well, I think either I, Irish system is I, going to I, be... I think perhaps... Uh, I, I'm, not, I'm not an expert on, on the Scottish system, but I, I, my understanding is it takes in the region of two years plus, and there are seven different approvals or licences within the agriculture licence system. It may well be that they had an implementation. I, I'm not sure that they, they f fell foul in any way of... Uh, the European Court of Justice in respect of the application of any individual directive. Um, so, so basically, so there, there isn't, the there isn't this, are okay. my, my, my understanding is there, there isn't a single cut and paste system that is singularly transferable to all member states. So we are grappling with the consequences of all those directives and, and, and our own legislation and framing a licensing process within that that takes account of those things. So um, the EU Commission made a bit of bespoke arrangement for Ireland? No, the, Ireland. no the, European, the European Court of Justice basically found that we weren't applying the, the, the uh, relevant directive and we, we then had to, to amend our, our licensing process to take account of that and that involved doing an appropriate assessment for all of those bays, 29, 29 bays yeah, yeah, yeah. identified around the country. Yeah. So that, I mean, that was quite some undertaking, and I appreciate the point that Senator McLaughlin makes about we're, we're some years on, 11 years on from that, but it was a mammoth undertaking. And as a consequence, understandably, a, a backlog of, of licences built up. But we did, and this is important because, and it's reflected in the growth of the sector even within the, the constraints that we're operating under, the, the, we did secure a, a permission that existing licences could continue to operate mm -hmm. whilst we built the infrastructure around make, being able to make better informed uh, decisions on, on those licence renewals as well as on new applications. So the agriculture licensing procedure in <laughs> Scotland, Denmark, France, Spain, Portugal meets all the same requirements that we do? Or they, all, they, all operate, they all operate under the same EU legislation. So, but we, I mean, so you know, some, some, states fall, some states fall foul of some uh, directors. We fell foul of uh, this one in the Court of Justice. Uh, you know, ruling obliges us to, to effectively go back to the drawing board in respect of our licensing system. Mm. I'm, I, as I said, no, I'm, I'm not an expert, nor do I, you know, uh, I, I know that the, the review group looked at international best practice as well. Mm. Um, so we've had to we've had to build our system from the ground up, effectively arising from that judgment, but secured a concession that the existing license holders could continue to operate. So if I make an application now for a bay that has been decided that, on yeah. and everything like that, how long will that take? Well, um, like for we, we, we will. Have, I, I would imagine less than two years. Maybe in the region, of two years would be my best guess. So if, uh, for any one of the bays that are done there now, the two years and sort of, so that would be on a par yeah. with everywhere else. Yeah. Okay. The, the estimation, Minister, just to make you aware, the industry estimates that the, uh, in, the, the economic loss we're talking about here in the context of Food Harvest 2020, they estimate the economic loss uh, with, with multipliers and, and so on uh, of 1.3 billion euro. It's devastating. You know, uh, just to, uh, so on that basis, I'd say to you, would you, uh, would you, uh, would you be willing to? Because you're, it's referred to a number of times that you've engaged with stakeholders. The department has engaged with stakeholders. But would you yourself be willing to meet with industry representatives uh, under the guise of the IFA, for example, to facilitate that? Uh, I, I, uh, you know, I, would I you, you yourself? Because I think it's important that they were able to stand in front of you and say, "Here's what we think the potential of this industry is." I Here's what we're asking. I don't think if, if you're under the impression that we don't, or I don't personally. Yeah. I, I, I alluded to in my in my opening remarks mm. the, um, the 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 late uh, Richie Flynn, who was the IFA. Yeah, no. I, I met with Richie, and I met with representatives of the sector. But, but, I have done so. But I'm asking you, on the basis of, of today's concerns of this committee, would you be willing to meet with the, the sector, industry the soon? Sector, the sector has ongoing engagement with both me and the department. I, I would, with the urgency, I mean, and you're a, t a, 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 a say this respect. I'm, I'm not, you're, not, you're, you're a TD representing the, the rural sector. coastal community. So this, I, I, in fact, I don't represent the coastal community, but I, I do very much understand and appreciate the potential okay. of the sector. Um, and I have had ongoing, and, and I mean, this was one of the first things that I did in the department on being appointed, was to get this review underway. And it was, you know, 
a, a significant undertaking for the people involved and their efforts I appreciate. Mm. And I think it, it is clear that the, the biggest uh, imperative there is to deal with the backlog. But I've, as I said, I've had ongoing uh, engagement and, and I continue to be able to engage. And, and so so the, if the IFA, which is a respected representative body, the if they are, were to put in a request... The IFA are constantly in and out of my office. I, 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 on all but matters. But I'm talking and, here and, I've never, and I don't think I've ever refused uh, to meet them. The aquaculture section... If they, including if they, the aquaculture yeah, section. So without uh, any individual company, but a representative group of companies, you would be willing to meet them? I, as I said... Well, that's, I, helpful. I, that's helpful. That's helpful. The, 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 ne the next point then is the the, the Aquaculture Licence Appeal Board, apparently they're postponing a number of determinations to 2019. Now obviously um, when you have a high volume, you've said I think it was 140 odd refusals, um, uh, negatives, then you'd imagine there's going to be quite a number of appeals um, going through. So again, are you are you satisfied that you've like I mean I would like if if there if there was a uh, an independent body dealing with licensing and a, a body dealing with um, with regulations and and, 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 and and ensuring the law is carried out but in the absence of that like would you be willing to put in additional resources into the aquaculture license appeals board so well, they can the, deal the with all of this? First thing I'd say is they are independent. Um, and I'm not aware that they have raised any issues around uh, resources being the issue, uh, mm. you know, in dealing with appeals. I think, though, you'll appreciate if if they're already postponing decisions to 2019, and they're they're about to face it. I mean, you can be sure there's going to be a high number. Be, it may well be for reasons other than resources. Yeah. Because I'll say this, Minister, and, and this is an important point to make, because obviously we're, we're concerned about the loss of economic growth in the coastal communities along the west of Ireland. But it's important to say that, that an efficient um, decision-making process and appeals process is in everybody's interest. So it's, it's, not, it's not just the industry, it's those who might be concerned. So, so all interested parties here, it's, it's best for everybody if that process can be as efficient and timely as possible. The other point, Minister, is you know you would have taken out trade delegations um, to foreign countries, and, and that's important work. That's important work. Uh, and, and you would talk about Food Harvest 2020, and you would look to find new markets, particularly in the, with the concern about Brexit and so on. So you have companies, say, involved in aquaculture, who are trying to find new markets. And they're trying to find new customers, but those customers want to know that they have a consistent, steady supply. And the problem for this industry is they can't guarantee it because if they're log jammed with appeals processes and they're stuck with very old licences, with 35-year-old regulations that you know that are not up to date, that are not part of the modern aquaculture industry, how can they possibly truly compete on the global market? And that's a, that's why I really think you need to meet the stakeholders as soon as possible because they are being asked to step up for Ireland, to find new export markets, uh, to you know to, to satisfy the demands of, of of new growing markets and customers, yet they can't guarantee a consistent supply of that product in, in, for five years, ten years. And you know, I'm sure you see yourself what a huge problem that is. And again, I, I mean, if, if nothing arises from today, if you could meet with the, the sectors and hear what their frustrations are and see it with your department officials, how, how, like whatever about, my, I have a strong view that there's been failure, right? Whatever people accept that or not, that's my strong view. I think it's backed up by considerable objective evidence. Like but, but we have but today is about the future. It's no good bleating about what's gone wrong. Today is about how we're going to move forward, how we're going to develop the potential of the industry, uh, how we're going to have a system that's fair to all. And I think if you were to meet the industry and hear directly from them, I think that would be a huge help. You know, I really do. Yeah, I, I, as I said, Senator, I um you reference one of the, one of the representative bodies. They are continuously in and out of my office, and I've never yeah. refused to meet them. Um, I, I have it in the trade missions, and there are there is an insatiable uh, global demand for seafood products, mm -hmm. and uh, aquaculture is critical to that demand. Um, in in fact, the the production from farmed, uh, whether it is shellfish or finfish. Uh, is likely to be the source of the majority of that of me meeting that majority of global demand than is, uh, you know, the wild catch mm. sector. Um, so it, it is a sector that we are very anxious that we maximise our potential in. 
uh, uh, bearing in mind when you compare figures of production, make sure you're comparing like with like. We, we have a specific niche market opera operation, primarily in the finfish side, on organic status. And certified organic status product is a, commands a premium relative to other production systems. And, and um, my, my, my ambition and the rationale, I keep repeating this point for, for conducting the review, was to see how we could unleash the potential um, for, for the sector. And I have been open to meeting with all the stakeholders in that context. And as I said, in the context of the, the licensing um, and the report, <coughs> I asked that, that that element of it would be um, prioritised, and as I make no apologies for that. But I um, look, I mean, collaboration is, is the hallmark of the, the agri-food sector, including uh, fishing industry and the aquaculture side and it's 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 working together um, that we will achieve the, the the potential that the sector has um, and as I said my door has always been open for that engagement okay sorry thank you thank you chairperson minister you, you just you, you mentioned briefly that the shot head um, cork application earlier and that a decision had been made by the department um, I don't want to get into detail, but just to give the timeline in relation to it, the department it was submitted to the department in 2011. There was a decision in 2015, and since 2015, it has been with the uh, the Independent Agriculture Appeals Board. So, yeah. that, I mean, there is, there is a pro there is a, I mean, I, I, as I said, I don't wish to go into the detail. Yeah. I'm aware of the detail of the case, but I don't wish to go into it now. But I mean, there are, there are circumstances surrounding the case that that. Um, cause that time, time delay in it. As um, I understand it, there was a requirement to, to re-engage in the public consultation process. Okay. Um, there's another application where an uh, environmental in assessment has been in since definitely. 2014 with the department uh, and a fresh application. But to, to touch on the, one of the recommendations of the actual um, review was that there should be increased resources to the Independent Agriculture or uh, Licensing Appeals Board. Um, is that something that's happened, or is that something that, uh, that, that you have committed to and that you plan? Um, and just to, to look at it overall, Minister, I mean, the reason we asked you to come in today is that while we, we, we got a, we, when the officials were with us the last day, we teased out the issues in detail. I, I certainly felt that we were being stonewalled in relation to the, the further and the implementation, the full implementation of the actual report um, itself, and in relation to the, the, the timeline, the timeline associated with the implementation of the various recommendations. And that's why we asked you, as the political head of the department to come in and actually discuss the issue. And I have to say today, I do feel that we are being stonewalled by yourself as well. Let me finish and you can uh, come back to them. Minister. I do feel we're still being stonewalled by you in relation to actually grabbing this and ensuring that the various recommendations are being implemented. Um, now, as I said you know, at the outset in my initial contributions, one of the, the key things which the, the review co committee um, said was that there should be an implementation report or an implementation plan put together. Um, looking at the 30 recommendations, assigning responsibility for them, putting a timeline in place for their implementation, and also assessing resource implica impl implications. Now, when we discussed this committee before, we have, what we were requesting was that there would be a, re, a review or a, an implementation plan put together by you. Now, today you still, you're still, and that's why we call you here, you're, you still haven't committed to actually doing that implementation plan. Now, it's accepted there will be different timelines associated with different implementation of different recommendations. But as a basic starting point in terms of responding to the, the, the report's 30 recommendations, Minister, I feel it's essential that you actually come back and that you uh, and the, the Department publish an implementation plan with regard to those 30, saying if you're in agreement that the 30, each of those 30 should be, put, should be implemented, and if you are, how it's going to go about 
you, how you're going to go about achieving them, and the, 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 de the timeline for to do it, and the resource implications. And if we see an, in assessing that, that there, there is a need for additional resources, and if it's felt that allocating those additional resources could lead to you know, improved growth within the sector, uh, you know, uh, improved financial return to the economy, then it, it, would be, it would make eminent sense to look at how you could allocate additional resources towards that. And you know, to get to the nub of the issue, I, I am looking for a commitment from you today that you would actually come forward and put that implementation plan together with timelines associated with it. And just in, in a couple of other points, uh, Minister, um, one of the recommendations of the report was that a, a reasonable time scale for license determinations, the report indicated that, that should be six months. That's what the report indicated that the, the reasonable timeline should be for all new applications after January the 1st, 2018. It should be it should be a six-month timeline. Another one of the recommendations said that work should commence immediately in relation to, to developing new legislation. Um, uh, the group recommended, the review group recommended that work commence immediately on the preparation of a new aquaculture legislation um, having regard to best practice in other jurisdictions and in other relevant consenting systems here, uh, other relevant consenting systems here in Ireland. That was uh, an immediate recommendation of the report. The new, now, when I asked the officials the last day in regard to this, we were, the answer was that work hadn't really commenced in the legislation because the resources weren't there to do it. Um, can I ask you for an update on that today, Minister? And can I also ask that you actually, if that, legis if that work hasn't commenced, that it, would, uh, that it would commence immediately and that you would allocate, uh, allocate the resources to it. Um, because certainly the feedback I've got is that in relation to the development of the sector, one of the stumbling blocks is that the fact that there isn't a streamlined licensing process there or specific timelines is leading to a reluctance um, to actually commence new, um, new, new licensing applications and to actually proceed with it. Just in relation to your opening contribution with regard to, to fin fish licensing, and you indicated um, that uh, the department are scheduled to formally request operators to submit environmental impact assessments um, in the coming uh, or before the end of the year, um, and will then engage with the with uh, with applicants in relation to those environmental impact assessments. And then you go on to indicate that this represents a significant response to the recommendations of the Independent Agricultural Licensing Review Group. Listen, I, you know, while that needs to be done, I mean, that's sort of that's the biggest point you're making there in relation to the finfish licensing application that you're indicating is a significant response to the review group. It's an essential part of furthering those licenses, but I mean, I would imagine there would need to be clear timelines associated with how we can expect those to actually those EIAs to be actually um, uh, dealt with and, and answers going back and, and uh, matters moved on um, once once you receive those. And finally, Chairperson, just in relation to the separation of um, the licensing the license, licensing powers to the development function within the department. Um, we had the Consumer and uh, Competition Protection Commissioner here last week talking to us in relation to the proposed uh, unfair trading practice um, directive coming out of Europe and very clearly saying to us that she felt that there needed to be a new, uh, a new se re sector regulator established to implement the uh, the directive coming from Europe with regard to unfair trading practices because of the fact that it was in conflict with their remit of consumer and competition protection um, because it was more about uh, the producer uh, and the, the consumer and uh, competition protection and therefore there would be tension between those two functions and that it wouldn't be appropriate to have people within the same body simply having that tension or the same person experiencing that tension within themselves that, that, that needed two separate, two separate bodies actually addressing those um, those objectives. And similarly, like I mean, while licensing is a function of the department here, development can often be in tension with it. And you know, yet we have a situation where it's the same people are you know are dealing with that that that, that, that those functions, which there should be a healthy tension. You know, often uh, uh, I think it's something that would need to be considered. But again, it's, a it's one of the 30 recommendations, and I think if you were to come forward and we were to see the implementation plan, that's something which could be fleshed out and which could be addressed, and we could get a clear line of sight in terms of what the department's response is going to be to it. I, I, um, 
thanks, Chairman. Um, just, just on the latter point, I mean, uh, and I, like the Department of Agriculture runs agricultural schemes. It determines the nature of the scheme. It invites the applicants. It determines the outcome of the application, and it polices the compliance with the terms and regulations. I've never heard you, Deputy, make the point because I don't think it's sustainable, or, 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 or you know, the case is made that the department shouldn't be responsible for for all of that. And you you make a different case for for the fishing industry uh, mm -hmm. for the agriculture side, as, as does the review panel makes that case. Yeah. But I, I, I don't. I, I'm, I'm not convinced by that argument. I'm not convinced by that argument. That, that uh, and it, it appears to be born out of a, a belief that, in some way, it might be, it, you know, it might be less onerous. Um, I don't believe that we, we all operate under the same law. So, uh, um, in, in many respects, I would say, be careful what you wish for, because well, it might not be as 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 understanding of breaches or, or compliance issues, okay. as perhaps the department is. If I can just make an interjection, a brief one there. Well, listen, if that's your position, fair enough, I mean, uh, it should be discussed and teased out, but it is the review that, I culture, that, that made it. Yeah. And it goes back to my point in relation to the fact that, you know, we're hearing from you today that you're not convinced on that point. In fact, in fact, you don't believe it's the right way to go. But it, it, it makes the point very much that what we therefore need is an implementation plan with regard to those reviews. Because if it's at the moment the industry is working off that review, and there's already recommendations, of which that is one, but we haven't had a clear response from the department that that isn't something it's going to pursue. If that's the case, then put the implementation plan together and say that in relation to that one, you don't think that's one that should be pursued. And let's let's have it clear, and let's have it all on the I table. Mean, um, I, I, don't, I appreciate your observations. I, as I said at the outset, um, what, I, what I thought was the most critical recommendation was to clear, and, and the report does say this itself, clear the backlog. That's what it says is the most critical service that we could do to the sector, and that's what we're doing, is, is dealing with that. Um, the, the rest is secondary. I mean, there's legislation required in some of it. Um, you know the difficulty in getting fisheries legislation through the House. Um, has to be started first of all, yeah, Minister. Yeah. You know. We have to have support as well, Deputy, uh, when we try it. Um, so I mean, uh, I, I hear I hear the points that are being made. Just just on resources, um, I mean, the, the, I, I'm advised that that the last time the Agriculture Licence Appeals Board sought additional resources, they were given additional resources. There's no current ask. Um, I think that might have been, if not last year, the year before last. Uh, so it's serious pressure coming at them. Yeah, but if they, if they, I mean, I'm saying there's no outstanding ask from the, from them in respect of. of uh, so as I said, there are other issues that cause delays other than resource uh, resources, and there, in fact, there has been additional resources given to the section as well in the department. Um, I. Um, I mean, I, I, I don't propose to kind of uh, change tack in respect of the, the overarching imperative to deal with the, the, the backlog. Um, we've touched on some of the other recommendations. I think the, the, there would be mixed views in the industry about some of the other recommendations, but the priority remains to clear the backlog. I would imagine in 2019, as we uh, proceed with the same level of progress, hopefully, that you know we can begin to look in more detail at, at some of the other recommendations, but this is the critical issue. Like, like, I mean, just to come back to that point, Minister, um, I, I don't think it's good enough to say that because that's the key priority within the review group's recommendations in the backlog, and rightly so, it is. It is a key, the key priority, which does re deserve the biggest amount of resources and the, you know, top status in relation to getting to getting movement, right? But I don't think because you're saying that's the key one and you're moving on that, that it's okay. That we don't actually that we, that we, we leave the moved, others we have secondary moved in terms of resources and yeah, no, but, so, but, but listen, I mean, there, there's there's 30 different recommendations there. If some of them, like you indicate, requires well, further I mean, consultation the six months, with the sector, then you touched you touch, you touch on the six months uh, recommendation. I mean, uh, and, and yet you equally refer. And I appreciate the six months is a target that's important to have. I would suspect it's extremely difficult to meet that target. Um, and other, you know, we've been referenced by the Scottish example. Um, the Scottish licensing is, is, a, is about two years. 
List if it's extremely hard to, to meet that six months target, then let's get a response from you as part of an implementation plan outlining why it's extremely hard to meet it and outlining what steps you're going to take to actually further it. Um, because at the moment what we have is, doing, but what, what, what I'm getting here is that we have a report with 30 recommendations and that by and large most of that report is, is going to gather a bit more dust on the shelf well, the before shelf we get to deal with it and, and look at it in any more detail apart from the couple of key pressing matters which, which you are dealing with. The with biggest service the that backlog. we will do which the report identifies <laughs> is deal with the backlog. Yeah, but, but, but can, can I ask today, Minister, that you actually would come back with a comprehensive response with regard to those 30? I mean, fleshing out the responses you're giving us here today, but let's get it in writing and get it in implementation plan. Once I, have, once I have sufficient progress made on the licences issue, I don't propose to, 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 to ask the division which is challenged to achieve that backlog. Uh, I don't propose to task them with, with other issues that are less important than that issue. It, it, it may listen. It, it may not. It, it may not take a massive resource application simply to put a no, timeline and a plan it, yeah. in relation to minister. And when we start to miss the the moment, it's just, just sitting the on the shelf. Of 2019, you know? which I don't propose to miss. I don't you, accept that. that. You, you said two thirds of the industry. We, we understand it's three quarters. So three quarters of the value of the industry, right, is in uh, uh, salmon, right? Uh, uh, well, 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 okay. Well, say we go with your figure of sixty-five million and fifty-seven million. Oh well, 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 well okay. Well, a very substantial. A substantial majority. Uh, we can, you can dispute that, but a substantial majority of the sector is, a, is in salmon, right? And what your officials? Well, to, to be sorry, there are 38 fin fish licences. There are yeah. over 300 yeah, shellfish yeah, licences that I, I, have been dealt with. I know, last but we're, year we're talking here about the economic value terms, but, but, but in terms of in, yeah, enterprises. Yeah, yeah I, I, and, and we're talking about the. E, this is about trying to get the overall aquaculture industry, uh, obviously giving people the right to, to object, which is absolutely their right, uh, and be a fair, efficient decision-making process. Sometimes they'll be successful, sometimes they won't, but the, the, the decisions are made uh, sharply and efficiently. But all I'm saying to you, and I repeat it again, Minister, is that, uh, that unfortunately the call you're making right now is failing uh, the, the, the failing to turn around the sector in terms of the large share of it. And, and, and I'm saying to you that, that, that we, we have asked in terms of 30... I mean, this report was published in May 2017. It's a year and a half ago, 18 months ago. And we, and we, and we have made substantial progress in uh, dealing with the backlog but, since but, then. But, but what I'm saying to you is, is there are 30 recommendations. Mm -hmm. and, and, None of them as critical and, as that. And here you are in the Houses of the Eroptus Committee a year and a half, a year and a half later. Now hold on. Uh, and I've, I've read out to you that we are 10% of the Scottish industry. 10% yeah. of a compartment. We're, 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 we're less than... We're producing we're, organic. We're, 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 like, we're, like but they're, they're, they're the facts. Your lack of knowledge is being exposed now. A bit the, of show the, uh, I, I, no, 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 no. The, 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 the facts are we're 10 percent of the Scottish industry, right, in terms of uh, actual hard numbers and value to, to the communities that we represent, 10 percent. We're less than the Faroe Islands. That's the scale of the failure that we have had. That, so, 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 Minister, and what your response to our committee is today, that can wait two more years. That sector can wait two more years for a, for a real solution. I'm going to focus on the low-hanging fruit, and I'm not going to address the recommendations. And, and, and Minister, like, like, I, I, I'm going to appeal to you again today to please open your mind. I know you rely on these senior officials for your guidance, but there are other people with expert knowledge out there too. Okay, That's the stakeholders. And I'm appealing to you today to, as soon as possible, sit down in the room. He would sit down with the stakeholders, though. Uh, well, well, what I'm saying to you as soon as possible, yeah. because when I, when I, I, I'll be honest with you, I'm stunned at where we're at here, because we're a year... A year we're a year stunned that we're making yeah, progress. No, 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 no. no, no, I'm, no. I'm, I'm stunned that I've read out those statistics to you today. We're a year and a half on, and you're in no way giving us any assurance that you're going to address all of the recommendations or address would the you, concerns. Would you, would you have the good grace, uh, Senator, to acknowledge the progress that has been made on the most pressing issue? The, the most pre the Two thirds, three quarters, two thirds on your numbers, you know, three quarters on the industry's numbers of the overall sector it's going to wait two years. It has to wait two years after all that I've read out to you. And you don't think that needs to be thought about, needs to be reflected upon, maybe keep an open mind until you meet them to see what can be done? Or are you just going to rely on the same department officials that have got us into this mess in the first place? 
Are you going to rely on their advice, or are you going to talk to the very people who have been failed? That's what I say to you today. I, 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 think, I think you should reflect on the... Uh, oh, I have no reflection. Spot, the objective you're, evidence you're, is shocking in my favour. You're grandstanding. That's not grandstanding, Minister. Oh. You're, 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 you're having you're, cheap shots I, at officials. The, 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 you're having the, cheap shots the, at officials the, who don't have the, the opportunity to defend the, 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 okay, the, so, the, so. These officials have presided over a calamity, a calamity in terms of the sector. I read out the figures a year and a half on, and still we're here where we are today. It dealt with the European Court of justice ruling, which, well, which would severely years. constrain their capacity. 11 years. I tell you, I've been 11 okay. years. Uh, I've been looking, looking at pensions Conlogan, at I'm going to close this discussion then and give the Minister one chance to reply and then we'll close. Can you give us a little bit more detail? You'd indicated, I think it's 38, or in the 38 applications in the fin fish sector, and they are going to be requested now before the end of the year uh, to f submit in environmental Environment, impact yep. assessments to the, yeah. to the department. That's a, that's a critical part of the licensing process. Yeah, so c can you take us from there that they'll get that now by the end of the year? Can you give us timelines in terms of what sort of targets you're working off for the completion of those, well, uh, deci for decisions then on those licenses? Each, each, each individual licence is different. That, but accepting each that, individual but, but, but can different. you give a general idea as to what type of timescales we're talking about? I, 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 don't want to, I, I don't want to do that, uh, Deputy, because if I, if I mention a timeline, but there won't be any undue delay on the department side. But what is that, so what do we talk? I mean, considering that other countries can do it in a, inside two years overall, yeah. like, you know, but, I mean, we're you, just getting you, to ask you, them by you, the end of this year for the I mean, EIAs. You, like, if there's outstanding documentation that has to be sought course, again, yeah, uh, yeah. you know, so it's, well, it's that difficult. That, but, but no, a, but as quickly as it's possible. Sure. How long is a piece of string in that sense? Like in the sense, I mean, well, I if, mean, if if deputy, we are making progress, and we intend to make progress on these as well. These are more complex uh, licensed processes than 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 uh, than the shellfish sector, uh, but we, we we will be commencing this process by uh, requesting environmental impact statements before the end of this year from the sector. And meet the industry as soon as possible. Okay, as, well, without, as, Minister, as, as, okay. As, as I've said, how many Minister, times do you need? Does Minister, it need to be said? Minister, Minister, the implementation, an implementation plan. You're not, you're not agreeing, Minister, to come back in relation to points and and uh, no, relation to those thirty I, and where the department no. currently stands. No. Deputy, which is I, what I, 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 I intend it. to drive the, the the principal recommendation to the point where I'm satisfied that we will achieve that, and I will reflect on the other uh, recommendations therein thereafter. But bear in mind, in terms of some of the other recommendations, there has been progress made already in terms of resource allocation. Okay. The Minister came in today, in fairness, gentlemen, to give an update on the cultural licensing process. And, and convinced after listening to this debate, you will be in, in, the, in, in the medium term again to give us another update on where the process is at. So I want to thank the Minister's officials for attending today's meeting and for bringing the Committee up to date on the cultural licensing process. As there is no further business, the meeting stands adjourned on the Tuesday, the 6th of November, at half three at 3.30. Thank you.